Today's episode of the Bill Simmons Podcast on the Ringer Podcast Network, brought to you by ZipRecruiter, our 2018 presenting sponsor, your own personal scouting department. I just went to the All-Star Game in Los Angeles. Guess what? ZipRecruiter is throwing an All-Star Game 365 days a year. Their powerful technology distributes your job to over 100 of the web's leading job boards, then identifies the right people with the right experience. All-Stars! and invites them to apply to your job. My listeners can try it for free at ZipRecruiter.com slash BS. Meanwhile, SeatGeek, the best app for buying and selling tickets to sporting events, concerts, and more. Right now, you can get $20 off your first SeatGeek purchase on any game or sporting event for NBA, NHL, baseball, whatever. You know what to do. All you have to do is use promo code BS. Download the SeatGeek app or go right to SeatGeek.com. Don't forget to check out the ringer.com where I think the entire staff has lost their mind over how great Black Panther is. We, we're just turning the ringer.com into a Black Panther site. Lots of good pieces up there right now. We also have Oscars coming in less than two weeks. We have some really fun stuff planned on the video audio side for that. I would encourage you to check out the big picture with Sean Fennessy. We're going to put out a big podcast of all the interviews that I did and more importantly, fantasy did because he did more with some of the best directors and stars that were involved with the Oscar race this year. So keep an eye out for that. And don't forget to check out all of our podcasts on the ringer podcast network. Just go to the ringer.com slash podcasts. I talked on Friday. I said there was a chance we might have Kevin Durant. People sent in some great mailbag questions. I have them in a document. They are ready to be uh, to be executed when we get Mr. Durant in a room, which I think will happen in the next two to three weeks. It's going to happen in Oakland. I thought it might happen in LA. I was a little dubious because there's a lot going on here, and uh, and we're pushing a couple weeks. But thank you. They don't send any more questions. I have more than enough. We're going to pin him down. It's going to be like Frost Nixon. Coming up, uh, we're going to talk to. Cousin Sal, and we're also going to run this interview that we did with Daryl Morey that uh, is really good because Sloan Conference is coming up in Boston. First Pearl Jam. All right, we're going to call Cousin Sal in a second. I want to talk about something that happened this weekend with uh, Adam Silver kind of opening the door for changing the NBA playoffs to a 1 through 16 seating situation where you throw the conferences out. This is something I'm passionate about. I think it was 2007. I wrote a piece. It might have even been for ESPN the magazine about the entertaining as hell tournament, which if you've if you've uh, consumed my content for the last 10 years, you've probably heard me mention a hundred times. But the idea of the of the tournament was that instead of just letting people throw away the last six weeks of the season, the reason I wrote about it, I think was in 07, everybody was tanking for Durant and Odin. So my thought was if you had a tournament for the two eight seeds in the playoffs, it would it would make it almost impossible for teams to just shut down players, which is what was happening. Like that, that year, the Celtics shut down Paul Pierce when he could have come back and all that stuff. So my thought was, if you guaranteed the first 14 seeds, so the, the one through seven in each conference, but then you said the eight seed was available in each conference for a play-in, you had a 16-team play-in, you put it somewhere, you made it a week-long thing, and then the winners got the two eight seeds, but then they played a final game and they got like, you know, the 15th pick in the draft and $5 million or whatever, whatever you made it, that that would just be more fun than what was going on. So people really liked that. Adam was not the commissioner at that point, but I had talked to him a bunch of times over the, over the next five or six years about it. And he, it always seemed like he wasn't totally happy with, with uh, the way the playoff system was. So, over the last five years, there's been a little more momentum. They're obviously tanking. People talk about it every year, and that's been a disaster. And I've been tweaking this idea over and over again. I put it on Twitter yesterday, but I wanted to just put it here so you guys could hear it and uh, and just really talk about it. I just think this is better. Tate, 
you be ready over there because I'm going to throw this at you. So first of all, let's start with the one through 16. If you did it right now, here's what it would look like if the season ended today. Houston would play the play in the second play in team. Golden State, number two seed, would play the the top play play in seed. Then it would be three Toronto versus 14 Philly. That would be an awesome series. Four Boston versus 13 Portland. That would be weird. Five Cleveland versus 12 Denver. Actually, I'd like Portland and Denver in those matchups, <laughs> by the way. Uh, six San Antonio against 11 Oklahoma City. Seven Minnesota versus 10 Milwaukee. And then eight Washington versus nine Indiana. That's just more fun than whatever the hell we had going on. Now, um, if you had the playing tournament, because we only locked down 14 seeds, you would have Utah, the Clippers, Miami, Detroit, and in my opinion, the sleeper of the whole thing, the Lakers, because I like the way the Lakers have been playing. Uh, I think Utah would probably be favored. The the stealth sleeper I had was Dallas, just because of Rick Carlisle and Dennis Smith, Mike at Hot, and Dirk, and they slow stuff down. The concept would be you'd have, you'd have basically it's a Sweet Sixteen single elimination. Um, I would have it so that there were home games for the higher seed the first two rounds. So maybe you have over the course of like uh, sat, maybe it starts Saturday and Sunday, and you have four games each day. And you just knock all the knock all the games out and get to the final eight. And then on Tuesday and Wednesday, you have the next two rounds to get to the final four. But then I would put the final four in a location. Tate, what would be the best location for this? The final four. Playing for the playing seeds. Would you go Vegas? I'm going to MSG. MSG? MSG. What about Seattle? To make up Maybe, to the people yeah, of Seattle for yeah. ripping the Sonics away from them. That's a nice, that's a nice gesture. MSG would be good too. Yeah. Just put it in the Mecca the first time and then we'll go from there. Yeah. So you do the final four and then you go back to back days. So you do Saturday, you do the two games and then Sunday you do the title, which is a little grueling, right? But then you have five days off before the playoffs. Um, first of all, I'd like to meet anybody who's not watching this. I think this would be fucking awesome. I, I just really like, I can't believe they haven't done this yet. It would be incredible, especially when you got to, uh, you know, the final four where the stakes are, you get into the playoffs, but I would also have a couple added wrinkles. And I thought about this a lot. You don't want to have the draft pick be too good because you wouldn't want people tanking to get into the tournament. But I think you could give the team that wins the whole thing could get the top pick of the second round. So before the second round starts, they get pick 31. And that's a nice that's a nice pick, right? You yeah. get a nice cheap salary thing. The other thing I would do is I would give them a $5 million trade exception for the following year. So you have two like real things. There's real reasons to try to win the whole thing. Now, Daryl Morey, my friend from Houston, who's coming up a little bit later, he was saying after it's decided and you have your two play-in teams that the top two seeds should be able to pick who they play. So we get it all. You have all the seeds, one through 16. And then the one seed says, nah, actually, we don't want to play the 16th seed. We'd rather play the 13th seed. We'll go with them, which is great for a couple of reasons. One, it sets up a scenario of the 13th seed being totally disrespected. <laughs> they wanted us. They got us. All that stuff. The drama of... Them pat that you, I mean, you could televise that. That could be like a special episode of The Jump or something where we find out what the actual matchups are. So that would be cool. The second thing is this is this is the way for the NBA to dump eight regular season games because they could make up the money. So let's, I mean, we all we all know now that the regular season should be shorter. If you got down to seventy four and you got that, basically everybody loses four home games. You could make up all the money with this tournament because there's 15 games total. Now, I'm not sure if they could sell it or maybe maybe they convince uh, the local affiliates and the owners and maybe they probably lose two ESPN games and two TNT games because they shorten the season. You make you make it up to them by giving that let, letting them split this tournament. And actually, you could probably make more money from it than you could from those eight games because I think they could sell this. This is 15 games. It's 15 nights. What could they sell that for, Tate? 
I mean, that's 15 playoff games, yeah, basically. It's a lot of money. The entire playoffs, I think, is like 55 games, something like that. Mm-hmm. Be pretty good. Who do you think would win? Utah, Miami, Clippers. Yeah, I think it's got to be the Jazz, right? They won 11 straight. The way they're playing right now? Yeah, yeah. Quinn Snyder. Guess what? I want to find out. I think this is so much more interesting. And then when you have the 1 through 16, the other wrinkle I would have is I would go best of five in the first round. I would go back to that because the first round is too predictable. Mm-hmm. And over the course of a seven-game series, it's just too easy for the slightly better team to have the advantage. I would go best of five with the wrinkle that the one seed and the two seed get four home games out of the five. So they would host one and two and four and five at home. And if you're going to beat them, you really have to beat them. And the the uh, the two lowest seeds would get game three at home, and that's it. But I think this would work, Tate. Yes. What is your hole? What is your thing that? What is your thing that you think? Now here's the one reason this won't work. I'm worried about the uh, the history of it all, like not being able to match up. But I guess when you have the five game series, it already you know it's already changed before. So that's that's more of my concern. Just that we can't match up the two eras or we split it like this is a different era. And Interesting. Yeah. Because I remember when uh, when TV really took off with basketball in the 90s, when like everything was on, once everybody had cable and the broadcasts were better and all that stuff. In the mid 90s, those best of fives were awesome. Mm-hmm. In the early 90s too, like Charlotte and Boston had an awesome best of five once when the Alonzo won it in game four thing, but that whole era was so unpredictable. And it was like, if you lost one of those first two games, you might not come back home. You know, like the Celtics had home fit home court in 93. And I think they lost game one, but that was it. It was like, Oh, I hope they come back for game five. They mm-hmm. never did. Um, I just think it'd be better. And I, I but, like five games and people seem to go all out too in the five game series. Cause you don't yeah, have the time. You have to, mm-hmm. you can't screw around. Mm-hmm. The seven is like, you can blow the first two and still win. Yep. You know, you can make up for it after the fact. So anyway, I uh, I really feel like this has a chance. I think they're ready. I think Adam's ready to do two things. I think he's ready to, to tweak the playoff system a little bit because they have so much momentum during the season now, especially with basketball Twitter and the ratings are up 20% and the marketability of the players, all that stuff. That to then follow that up with like just a shit round one where it just goes on too long. You know who's going to win every matchup. The same kind of teams are playing each other every year. There's kind of no unpredictability. If the All Star game, which we're going to talk about with Sal in a second, if the All Star game showed us anything yesterday, it's that kind of shaking the snow globe works. The reason those guys were playing hard was because it was weird because they were playing with guys they'd never played with before and teammates were going against each other. And you see like the last play of the game. Curry has that three and Durant knows what he's going to do. I thought there was a level of, of uh, gamesmanship and competitiveness that I haven't seen in the, from the all-star game in 13 years. I thought it worked. And I, I really like seeing the weird combinations. I love seeing Kyrie and Westbrook and LeBron and, uh, and that, Durant all on the same team was fucking amazing. And that was the play. Like the game wouldn't play to LeBron. It's like a Russell Westbrook drive past to Kyrie on the baseline, Kyrie back to LeBron for a lay in, you know, yeah. to take the lead. It's crazy. It was cool. And, to see like somebody like Embiid just seamlessly fit in there and and Giannis not being a thousand percent ready. He's like a year away from I think dominating that game. He didn't he didn't it was funny watching him. He didn't totally know how to play off the ball. He seemed a little nervous too. He seemed nervous mm-hmm. and he has the ball all the time in Milwaukee. And in that situation, he's playing off the ball. He's kind of running around like a chicken with his head cut off a mm-hmm. little bit. Whereas, like, you watch somebody like Al Horford, who just knows exactly where, you know, the sage veteran who's been in a million games and knew exactly where to go all the time. Or, like, Paul George, same thing. Paul yep. George comes in, and he's just like, that dude didn't need the ball. He knew exactly what to do on both ends. Even Lillard, um, when Lillard came in. Lillard was good. It's it's a really nice... The reason that it was so sad that they screwed up the All-Star game like they did was it was a really nice litmus test for kind of who the best players were, what their confidence level was as a superstar and all that stuff. And um, I thought yesterday worked. I thought LeBron tried hard because he was playing for Team LeBron <laughs> and he uh, he was trying to save face. So what I'm hoping is they fix the All-Star game. 
I'd like to see them fix All Star Saturday, which is really still two events. I, it's never, I've written about this for 12, 15 years too, but it's never been explained to me why they wouldn't do horse and at least do like a final four of horse. And I would much rather watch that than the skills challenge. The, the reality, All Star Saturday, I, sh- I didn't show up till an hour in because I knew I didn't need to see the first hour. Um, but they are trying to make stuff happen, they are trying to become inventive. And the other thing Adam talked about was the one and done rule. It really seems like he's going to fix that too. Tate. Let's end it. It's time. What are, are you and Titus anti one and done? Definitely. It hurts college basketball. And I think it also hurts the NBA too. I would like to see them go to a baseball system where it's either go to you're going right now or you have to stay in college for two years mm-hmm. and there's no in between mm-hmm. and make the, and I mean, my dream would be a committee where we had 12 people and they would decide who was ready to come right in. And I think the people, too, once they get done with the, once they get rid of the rule, there's going to be a grace period where we're going to have some bad situations where guys go straight out of high school that don't work out. And then people are going to say, well, we need to fix this. This is a problem. But you, you just have to let people weed themselves out on their own. Well, we've also bit. had bad one and done situations. Yep. Yep. You know, like uh, there's been guys who if they'd gone right from high school would have been top five picks and then they a year passes. Shabazz I think what, Muhammad. Perfect. Example. Yeah. I think what happened to Ben Simmons at LSU was just a complete waste. We lost two Ben Simmons years. We lost one when he went to LSU and clearly was in the wrong situation. And then he got hurt. But I would like to see the baseball system of uh either come in right away or you can't come in for two years i would also like to see them boost up the g league because the g league should be awesome Mm -hmm. and unlike a college where the players are still getting paid we just don't find out about it in the g league at least they'd get paid (laughs) they have a contract and they get better accommodations and And, and we get all the two-way guys now too which is great yeah so i think uh my takeaway from all of this is i think adam has done a really good job these last five plus years and I guess it's been five. And I think he is ready to start flexing is my takeaway. I My predictions over the next five years would be they're going to completely blow up the playoff system. They're going to get rid of one and done. And I think we have two more teams. I think that's the third thing. Because if you, have, if you get rid of uh, all the stuff goes hand in hand. If you get rid of... If you bring in the high school players immediately, that takes jobs away from the veterans, right? Mm -hmm. Well, you know what doesn't take jobs away from them? Two more teams. Yep. 15 more spots. 30 more spots. 30 more spots. So that would allow teams to take a high school guy and just stash him. Mm -hmm. Um, Maybe there's all kinds of ways you could tweak it, but... You know, I've been getting a lot of emails from the Louisville area. They, they, or, or I should say correctly, Louisville. So Haley O'Shaughnessy doesn't get mad at me. Louisville. Louisville. I would say Louisville, <laughs> but it's Louisville. Louisville. You have to say it like you, you're drunk. Louisville. Uh, but apparently they have a state-of-the-art NBA arena, and everybody there is jazzed and fired up for an NBA team. I need to do more investigating, but that's mm-hmm. that's the word in the street. You seem dubious. I choose Virginia over Louisville. Virginia? Yeah. Like Where? Homage to the Squires. Just bring them back. The rich, the rich, oh, the Richmond area. Tate loves the Virginia yeah, yeah. Beach area, somewhere like Virginia that. Virginia Beach, yeah, somewhere like that. They tried Tide to get water. the Kings once. Yeah, why not? It's a nice little growing area. They have a lot of tech jobs up there. It's a very underrated area. You don't think if uh, if if Louisville gets it, bring Patino back as coach GM? <laughs> yeah. Let's do this, man. I like it. I like it. That'd be good. <laughs> we'll get Chauncey Billups on staff. That'll be perfect. <laughs> Uh, anyway, I think Adam's going to blow some stuff up and I think it's going to be awesome. And I'm super excited for it. All right. We're going to bring in the cuz. Let's talk about Gillette first. I have been shaving since college. You know, what changed my life. The Gillette fusion ultra sensitive skin shaving gel. Recently, I also started using the Gillette fusion pro shield razor. I ordered it. I got four refillable razors and free shipping. Then every fourth order free because I subscribed Right now I have a scraggly beard, but I shaved my neck the other day and it reminded me how great it is to just shave my neck and not have cuts all over it. Cause that's what happens when I use Gillette. Right now you can get Gillette performance delivered to your door. No more getting mad at yourself because you just got back from the grocery store and realized you forgot to buy blades. Subscribe today, pick your favorite razor, get every fourth order free. Visit Gillette online at GilletteOnDemand.com.
All right, let's call the cuz. All right, Cousin Sal on the line. On Wednesday, we are running The Best of Parent Corner Part 2. It's a 90-minute extravaganza of all of the Parent Corners we did from like week 9 or week 10 all the way through the playoffs. And then that's it. We we have abandoned our parenting corner. People miss it. More importantly, Cuz, you... I, I just I worry, but this is when you it gets really dangerous for you. Like, like yesterday, I'm at the All Star game. All of a sudden, we're betting on Giannis to win the MVP. Like this is when <laughs> it gets dangerous for us. There's Winter Olympics, college hoops, some random NBA, NHL, some spring training, baseball. What what are you doing? What are you gambling on these days? I was I was at the Genesis Open in Pacific Palisades yesterday, betting hole by hole on the on the golf tournament and uh. Luckily, I ended up with Bubba Watson at the end, but it, it was a it was a long road to get there. Between that and Winter Olympics, it's been tough. I, I got excited when when the phone rang, but I, I realized it's not it's still the off season, right? We're not back. We're not officially back yet. No, we're yeah, we're, yeah it's like the preseason Hall of Fame or <laughs> yeah. something. Yeah, yeah, I'm I'm, uh, I'm still licking my wounds from the Super Bowl. The sounds of the game and inside the NFL and all those shows where they have all the people mic'd up. I I, I tried to avoid it. I can't. Now I've become progressively more bitter as it's gone along. I thought I was going to be able to shake this one off, but it's it's not happening. So, Yeah, I feel like I've talked to a few Patriots fans, and they say the same thing. The day after, they were like, just like you were, well, well we have our five championships. It's fine. It could be a lot worse if we didn't have Tom Brady and Belichick throughout the years. But, yeah, the, the offseason is a son of a bitch, and the highlights don't end. And uh, yeah, it's 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 gonna be rough for you. I'm sorry. I don't know what to even tell you. It really hurts the part when because uh, I realized something a couple of days later. Maybe I was in denial. I mean, Belichick definitely got out coached in that game, but mm-hmm. like nine and a half minutes left, the Eagles get the ball, and at that point, the only thing that can't happen is the seven and a half minute drive, which is exactly right. what happened. But during the sounds of the game, they cut to the Pats get the ball back with two twenty one left. Jim Schwartz goes over to Peterson and it's Mike. And he's like, I'm going to, I'm going to send everything and either we'll make a play or, or you'll get the ball back. And and Peterson's like, great. So basically he was saying, I'm going to pressure the shit out of Brady. And if they score in five plays, great. We'll get the ball back with a minute. I don't understand why the Patriots didn't do that. And I, I am now rooting for Matt Patricia to go own 16 in Detroit. I'm I'm shorting them. I'm betting the under for them. I'm I'm going all in. Screw Matt Patricia. <laughs> he cost me a Super Bowl. Why didn't the Pats just blitz and try to make something happen? I don't know. I do know this. When the Patriots are, are playing great defense with no names, Bill Belichick gets the credit. And now when Matt Patricia forgets to blitz somebody, he's he can go to hell. But I know what you're saying. I've thought about it so many times with Brady. It's like, this guy is just, you know, he's he's doing whatever he wants to do back there. Send somebody. You know, how how yeah. do you want to get beat? It's worse. So, yeah, you guys should have sent someone somewhere in the seven and a half minutes. One thing that's interesting, though, when you got the ball back with 220, you were like a minus 260 favorite to win. Seriously? Down yeah. five? Yeah. Jesus. Yeah, everybody, people are people are sick of uh, losing money on the Patriots. That, that's how sick they are. Tell us about uh, the Winter Olympic stuff you've been betting on. I've actually, maybe I should only bet every four years in the Winter Olympics because I'm, I'm hitting on a lot of things. I have the the gold medals under 10 and a half for the U.S., and what do we have, like five? I feel bad betting it. But, uh, Wait a second. You bet on the under for gold medals for our own country? I thought we were only winning nine or ten the way it's – yeah, we own snowboarding, but we have nothing else. We hit some of these slaloms, but what, what else are we good at in these Winter Olympics? Why are we so bad at some of these sports? I don't know. We even tried to create extra sports so that we'd be better at all of this stuff, and apparently it didn't really, didn't really work. Well, it's is it bad. because none of these are available in high school? Like that, that's like track and field. You know, you know, a bunch of people ran track and field, and it's nice to add sports. But yeah. if they don't have a program in high school in the U.S., we're going to fall behind immediately, right? I would like to see us start cheating more. I think the other countries are cheating. <laughs> um, I think I think we've had a lot of success in professional sports with the cheating. And yeah. I would like to see us uh, move that more to the Olympics and really start thinking about streamlining some of this stuff. Put our best scientists right. toward it. Got to get better at skiing, better more more red blood cells in the oxygen. Let's just go for it. Hey, uh, yeah. Yesterday with the All Star Game and celebrity, all, all that stuff. Did you have all? Mm-hmm. Were you in on all that stuff too, or no? 
I had uh, I had slam dunk. No, I didn't have slam dunk. I had the three point winning contest, uh, three point shooting contest. I picked that winner. It was a Booker, right? Booker, I yeah. Come, Mitch, right. I had I had Booker and Gordon, so I'll count that as a half a win. Uh, that was nice. The slam dunk I stayed away from. I, I, I just if DJ Khalid is 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 deciding where my money goes, I'm <laughs> yeah, just you know I'm out. That right? actually should be a, re- a way to get a refund. Yeah, yeah, I no kidding. I, I don't. What, what are they doing with the judges up there? But who did you think should have won that? Did they think Smith got robbed? What do you think? Nah, I thought Mitchell should have won, but. I was sitting in the stands. I called out Booker as the three-point winner before the contest. Uh, and I called out Mitchell uh, for the slam dunk. And, of course, never texted you and, and talked about uh, actually betting on either of them. I thought I, – I really liked Booker. I don't know what his odds were. But um, I don't know if you could see I, – I went to Saturday. I went to Sunday. Yeah. DJ Khaled was sitting next to Mark Wahlberg. And nice. he was doing this air horn thing, DJ Khaled. And by the fourth time, it looked like Wahlberg was just going to get up and start hauling off and just punching him. And he was just pissed off in general. I think he was furious at his agent. Um, I haven't seen people that furious at their agent since our own agent, Baby Doll Dixon, uh, with that that kind of antipathy and confusion and anger. But uh, but uh, it, Mark Wahlberg was not happy to be there. I have no idea what they're doing with the dunk contest where. That just keeping it one to ten seems crazy. If the score is up to fifty, why yeah. not just have everybody rate the dunks from one to fifty? And then it's like you don't uh, you don't have to either have a fifty or a forty five, basically, or the two outcomes every time. I think the problem is they they approached uh, the panel with this, and uh, the problem is uh, DJ Cali can only count up to ten. Oh, so, is that what it was? Um, yeah, that was it. So they had to keep it one through. When ten. is it? <laughs> yeah. Are we at the tail end of this DJ Cali thing? <laughs> no, you got to get Corolla going on him. Not, uh, not, not a huge fan, but he's uh, fun. He's he's fun. No, I don't know. He's tape, fun. <laughs> tape, tape. Does your generation is this is this like a your generation thing, DJ Khaled? He's been famous for like ten years, but now he's like popular. You know, general public. Famous. Do you find him humorous or funny in any way? No, he's never been humorous or funny. He but made I, music. I, I think he's presenting himself as humorous and funny. He used to yell "We Global" all the time, which was entertaining. But now it's uh it's worn its welcome. So the amazing thing yesterday, what was yesterday's date? 219? 218. 218. It's a, it's a borderline remember the events of 218 because Kevin Hart came out and uh, it was the worst 14 minutes I've ever seen in person. It was right. not only was it not funny, it was it was confusing, it was weird. Uh, the audience, everyone in the room was like what the hell is going on? It it wouldn't stop. People were there for basketball. It just kept going, yeah. and then it led to him introducing all the all stars and kind of like roasting them, but not in a funny way. And right. uh, and just when you thought it couldn't get any worse, Fergie came out and sang the national anthem and did it like Marilyn Monroe style. <laughs> Fergie saved she saved Rob Riggle and, and Kevin Hart because all the vitriol was going their way. And I tweeted that. Well, I know that the MO for the NBA All-Star game is to not try hard, but this yeah. this sketch takes it to a different level with Rob Riggle and Kevin Hart. It was really that bad. Was something. And and what's funny is the game itself was really good, so everybody kind of forgot awesome. about it, but the first 20 minutes was uh was shaky. My favorite part was uh our cousin Jimmy was sitting right next to Spike Lee, who is yeah. <laughs> not exactly uh the most hilarious guy alive. It's just like <laughs> I didn't sit next to Spike Lee for four quarters. It's Jimmy just, and Mark it's Wahlberg just were uh, frantically trying to uh, set up a trade for their seats. I don't know. It didn't didn't work out at they the sh- end. But. They should have given Jimmy an air horn. Um, <laughs> let's quickly next yeah, week. Yeah, I thought that I thought that was the best All Star game this decade, and uh, I uh, that I know that's not saying a ton. People get at me for the baseball All Star game that went 15 innings, but I remember just wanting that to end. But that that was a great ending. It sucks that they, you know, down 13, Team LeBron decided to play defense, and they, they're just able to do that. And it pushed, for a gambler's perspective, that freaking game pushed. They were they were covering for like 22 seconds, Team LeBron, favored by yeah. three. And, uh, and, it, and it pushed, or if you got two and a half, it won. I have no idea why the new world rules worked and inspired everybody to play harder, but they absolutely mm-hmm. did. It was I. I had stopped going to the All Star game because I just there's not to me the seventh circle of hell is is bad pickup basketball. It just it bothers right. me on so many different levels. This time, um, not only was were people playing hard, but even on the benches, 
you could see um, people were really locked in and jumping up on plays and trying to get calls and all that stuff. We bet on Giannis at plus 550 Yeah, for a couple of reasons. One, I actually thought team staff could have and should have won. And it seemed like he was on that team, the, the guy positioned to kind of have the biggest impact. And I actually think it was the right bet, and he didn't play well. I think if he had played well, he would have won the MVP because it was kind of sitting there. He had the most minutes. He was guarding LeBron. He uh, he was kind of their rebounder shot blocker along with Embiid, who they were protecting with minutes. And he, he I don't know, he, he wasn't 100% ready for that stage to be like one of the best five players in the world. What was funny was Embiid was. I, I was really impressed. Yeah. With Embiid. And, you know, I tweeted that. And then you look at the tweets and the Philly fans are like, oh, welcome to the club. Oh, oh, congratulations. You finally realize Embiid's good. It's like <laughs> Embiid's played 75 games in four years. He's right, played. Right, right. I looked it up. He's played like 2,173 minutes or something like that. LeBron's played almost 2,100 minutes this year. So. Mm -hmm. I actually think it was incredible that Embiid was able to just kind of belong on the court and and do his thing with, you know, LeBron, Durant, Curry, the best guys in the league, and he belonged with those guys. And I don't know, it made me increase the ceiling on him. Now, with that said, he's you know, played 75 games. Yeah. You know, you did a very bad thing just now. I don't know if you realize you even did it. And Tate, you might want to cut it out, but you admitted to your listeners that you read the tweet replies, and I hadn't heard you say that in a long time. No, so. the ones that were underneath. I clicked on the oh, tweet. I, I clicked on the tweet I, to make sure okay. it would go through because the Wi-Fi okay. and the staples was so bad. And then I saw like the first two tweets underneath were like, "Oh, whoa, oh, oh, really? And Bede's good." It's like, yeah, actually, it's okay. kind of a big deal that he hasn't played eighty games yet. And he was, he was out awesome. there. awesome. He's in his early 20s. How old is he? He's, 20, He's like 23. It, and 23. I got to right. say, if, if I'm a Rockets Being fan. up against LeBron, pretty good. Yeah. And if I'm a Rockets fan, I know it's the All-Star game, but that was yet another uh, Coach D'Antoni special down the stretch there. Yeah, right. He had the wrong guys out yeah. there. What's funny is he, the most effective guy he had was Al Horford for what the game was. Cause Al Horford's like good defender doesn't care if he shoots. Um, but, but it's like, he probably should have played Horford and Embiid together. Cause Horford knew what he was doing, but Tate, you watched that game, right? I did not a, not a Mike D'Antoni classic down I, the stretch. I thought Embiid had a chance to win MVP. For a he little did. While. It was sitting there for like sure. five seconds. I was texting. We were texting the whole game. I never gave up on the honest MVP because it became clear if, if his team won, there was no MVP. So whoever had a good fourth quarter was going to win it. And I tweeted, I think, at the end of the third period that um, that it was sitting there for LeBron. Because LeBron, they were losing, but LeBron had the stats. And it was like, all he has to do is play well for one quarter. They win the game, they win the MVP, which is exactly what happened. And that was my, my main takeaway from last night is, you know, sometimes with the All-Star game, you, you all these guys are on the court. They're actually playing hard, and there's this natural hierarchy that develops. And he was the best player. He still is. Well, let me just say this. I, I jumped on your Greek freak MVP. I try to convince you at the last second, let's take LeBron and Curry. Maybe this is just too easy. Right. We're, we're, uh, we're overthinking this, whatever. LeBron, I think, was 13-2 to two to, to an MVP. But I only gave up on the Greek freak winning MVP once. And that was when he didn't play the entire third freaking quarter. Right, right. Yeah, that was a problem. <laughs> he wasn't in at all. <laughs> like, and, and that makes me think, like, that's just another layer of why you shouldn't bet the NBA All-Star game. Like, to bet the over or under is just insane to not root for those points or to root more, for more yeah. points. But to bet the game itself, you don't know who's trying. You don't know who's, who's – you don't know who had a crazy weekend. It looked like Jimmy Butler – and the Greek freak just went out hard and, um, and it showed a little bit on their play. Like you knew the Greek freak was going to get to the, get to the hoop and dunk four times once a quarter. So you're going to get your 10 there. Um, but yeah, Not Jimmy, it, Jimmy Butler, now, game Jimmy Butler sat it out. Yeah. Right. Yeah. That's it. He, he was, what, I mean, what was the story? He just didn't, uh, he just didn't come to practice or what? I, uh, unclear. It's an interesting yeah. move. If you know you're not going to play that much to be like, my knee hurts, I'm just going to sit <laughs> on the bench. But it's the uh, alternative was me playing 12 minutes. I thought yeah. the way that game shook out, 
it was kind of impossible for Team Curry not to win because their their overall team was so much better than the LeBron team because LeBron had just lost like three major guys. So they're when the mm-hmm. the bench of LeBron's team was in versus the uh, the Steph team, it was no contest. But Steph was terrible. Harden looked like he hadn't slept for three days, and Draymond was practically in a coma. So yeah. that that none of that was helping. That's why I would have played Horford because Horford actually seemed like he had gotten a reasonable amount of sleep the whole weekend. But the most entertaining thing is Draymond during Fergie's anthem. Go look look it up. And my cousin, our cousin Jimmy, is, uh, is on directly after Draymond's cutaway. So oh, he has he? his mouth wide open. When you talk <laughs> about a coma. Fergie Fergie didn't help matters. <laughs> I don't know what that was, but look it up on YouTube. My yeah. highlight of the weekend was I talked to Sean McVay for a half hour on Friday night and he was every, every bit as great as I wanted him to be. And he promised he would come on the BS podcast. So stay tuned for that. Oh, great. He's like a year older than Tate. Yeah. Like he could hang out with Tate and you wouldn't, you would think they were the same age, but he was, uh, yeah, Tate thinks he's ahead of the game. You know, he produces these podcasts. He's he stars in them. You need to get your shit together. Tate, you got an NFL head coach who's like four months old. Yeah. You're still behind Sean McVay, Tate. Uh, yeah. Last thing, and then we're going to go. The uh, Oscars next week on on Against All Odds with Cousin Sal, America's favorite gambling podcast. Yeah. You're going to do some Oscars. We're going to get it going. You're going to do some Oscars. I know you like uh, Get Out. I, I'm, we tried to talk you out of it. You, you think you think it's a winner, but I guess it's 15 or 20 to 1 odds. It's, it's, it's a fun bet. Yeah, so Best Picture is really interesting to me because there are nine nominees. And mm-hmm. Shape of Water is minus two twenty, the favorite. Three Billboards is plus one forty. Lady Bird is eleven to one, and Get Out is fifteen to one. And Dunkirk is forty to one. And there's been some industry buzz that even though those are the odds, that it's Get Out versus Dunkirk is how this is going to actually shape out. My mm-hmm. argument, Jimmy, we, you, me, and Jimmy were texting about it um, this weekend, and Jimmy, of course, was as dis- dismissive and uh, arrogant as always about it, but he. He, he, give me the token laugh on that. I was, I was making a joke. <laughs> I'm trying to think like what, but it's, uh, he was he just, he was just him into gambling on it. No, which, he didn't, uh, get, he know. didn't gamble on it. No, he didn't want to gamble on said, it. I'll take your, uh, I think I thought he said, I'll take your bet on this. Oh, does it, are we going to bet on this? This is great. I'm going to, I'm going to do it then. I'm going to bet him. I don't know I'll if go. the Oscar host is allowed to legally bet. I mean, they may carry him <laughs> off the stage. <laughs> That's true. May, we have to back him up. But, uh, <laughs> but he was adamant that, that, get out that it was going to be shape of water, three billboards. And my argument is like with nine nominees, what, how many votes do you actually need to win the Oscar? Yeah. Like if, two. if one, it, all right. So let's say one out of every five, just like they say, screw it. I like get out the most get out was the coolest mm-hmm. get out's the movie. I'll remember in 10 years, whatever. Then, then it might sneak it out. Right. Almost like how Trump won the election, where it's like, ah, well, I would, with the yeah. math, it, that, and then it acts like, oh, the math can work. So it's exactly like Trump. It is exactly <laughs> like Trump winning the election. No, I think you're right. The one thing, like, you used to be able to say, well, this won the Golden Globe, it won the SAG Award, it won this, so it's going to win. Um, it's going to win Best Picture. But now that they diluted the pool, now that there's like nine or ten uh, nominees. That all goes out the window. So it is going to be interesting. So that's my argument. So I, I like best actor, best actress. I think it would be crazy to bet against like Frances McDormand. I think she's going to win. And if she doesn't, yeah. the odds aren't really, I don't know. It's just if she, if she gets like 40% of the vote, she wins. They don't show us the votes, unfortunately. But with Get Out, right. I just think with the nine, it makes it so much harder to figure out how a consensus would win. You know, right. and somebody could just steal it. So, but you're still not convinced. Mm-hmm. All right, I could buy that. I could no, buy it's that. A, that, no, you're not convinced. Don't. I don't want. I'm your, not convinced. I don't want your courtesy <laughs> nodding. I'm gonna have some. Uh, I'm gonna have some ringer experts on next week, and we're gonna we're gonna tell you how to how to nail your uh, Oscar pool and win money from your loved ones and friends. I'll tell you what shouldn't win is Call Me By Your Name, which was basically a movie about two guys cycling around Italy. Yeah. Come on. They loved it. No, that was People a, that love was that movie. A, it's like, hey, you guys want, want to go for another bike ride? All right. <laughs> hey. Hey, want to stop over on this hill? Great. Hey, want to ride back? <laughs> if, if sure. That shot, <laughs> if that shot in the streets of Detroit <laughs> does get any buzz, like I think like, oh, it's Italy. It's beautiful. Look what they're doing to the peaches. 
Right. They're fornicating with the fruit. Oh, this is just the greatest. I don't think if it has any of that, uh, we're even talking about it right it's now. It's a fine movie. It just shouldn't should it be an Oscar, like one of the t- yeah. movies that could win an Oscar. It, and it's funny because it's it's convinced me once and for all that any movie set in Italy is forty seems 40% better than it actually is. And it could be yeah, any movie. Right. Like in The Godfather, he goes to Italy, and those are the best scenes in The Godfather. Nothing yeah. really happens. Like he just he mm-hmm. stares at Apollonia. They have this terrible wedding. He met her like three minutes ago, and then their car blows up. And it's like, wow, the Italy scenes; those are incredible. Oh, how about when they yeah. walk through? You know, and then like there's that Diane Lane movie when she goes to Italy mm-hmm. that my wife always watches. It's terrible. It's like your typical terrible rom com, but it's in Italy, so she loves it. So yeah, I think someone should put this theory to the test. I think like. Uh... Like Tyler Perry should take the Medea movies to like Rome <laughs> and see uh, see what kind of buzz he gets. <laughs> anything <laughs> if he can go yeah, on a nomination. Anything that's outdoors where they're just kind of walking around and there's a lot of wide shots of how pretty Italy is, it, it's going to do yeah. well. People are just going to think it's fantastic. Yeah, I yeah, think yeah. if Netflix they're throwing all this money around, they should just say we're setting a a, a drama in Italy. It's just a drama mm-hmm. and just things will happen. People will go on some cycling trips. People walk around. Maybe there's a wine tasting episode, and it'll just be great. Uh, I get out is fifteen to one now. I still think, I still think that's the best deal of any of these things. I could totally see it winning. And also, I think you're going to be. I think you're going to get out your checkbook and and write uh, whatever <laughs> amount you're betting on it. That's what I think. But the be uh, fun. the shape of water. If that wins the Oscar, I'm going to be very upset. Is all I have to <laughs> that say. That was beautiful, though. Oh my god. <laughs> I, I would. I mean, John Wick. John Wick Two has a better case than The Shape of Water. <laughs> Terrible. I, th- I think the three billboards and the current climate and uh, strong women and all that. I think that's gonna. I think that's gonna get the most. The problem though is there. There's up. been three billboards backlash though. People are saying it's like this decade's crash. Not a Go compliment. The other way. Yeah. Yeah. Guess we'll see. Do you have so a pair? Good. I thought ninety percent you- of it was good. <laughs> Not, I mean, not, not, not the killer cycling scenes that uh, "Call Me by Your Name" had. <laughs> cruising around those bicycles, man. Whew. It's like five uh, different bicycling scenes. Breaking Away had less bicycling scenes than "Call Me by Your Name." Who um, knew the Winklevoss twins could could cycle? <laughs> well, they did just throughout the whole movie. Nice job. Um, the um, uh, parent corner. We're running it Wednesday. I didn't know if you wanted yeah. to sneak one in. I have one. It makes me sound like an a hole, but uh, okay. it, it, it's not great. But we found out my uh, four year old is allergic to dairy products, and I did not want a kid allergic to anything like this, just let alone dairy. I love ice cream. I want to take them out for ice cream. I want to eat ice cream. And now this little son of a bitch is allergic to dairy, and it sucks because we tested it out, and he swells up and he gets blotchy and everything. But. I don't know. What am I? Am I allowed to give them back? What do I do? Or I just have to love them, right? So you're saying you're personally offended that you've created a child that is allergic to dairy? Yeah, it's I one of the biggest one of the biggest parental failures of your career. It's got to be. It's got to be. And there's no reversing it, right? The problem is the the problem with with uh, the da- the dairy allergy is you feel bad when you're having pizza. Yeah. You feel bad when you're having ice cream. Like it's it's more it's more it's more the parental guilt that it's affecting your right. life. You you don't care about his life as much as it just affects your life. It's like yeah, really we can't have pizza because this little yeah. this little shit's allergic to dairy. Yeah, my That's my the, uh, yeah. my son I didn't is like say it, but no, I, I just want I want to. Yeah, I don't think. I don't know, like if you were born and you you had the ability to make decisions and you said, all right, here's the deal. You could, uh, you either, um, can't, you have to go without ice cream and pizza for the rest of your life, or we'll take your left arm. <laughs> what do you do? You have to think about it, right? I would, yeah, I might give up a pinky. Yeah, all right, a pinky for sure. I married <laughs> my, I married my wife who is allergic to shellfish. Oh, yeah. It's bothered me for That's 20 right. years. It just, it, sometimes mm-hmm. it's just really annoying. Like, I'm having a good lobster, great clam chowder. You can't give somebody a bite. It's just freaking annoying. Um, it's why you had to leave Boston, right? <laughs> yeah. 
Well, there's this there's this famous story between us where we went to famous, I mean, in our friend circles, because she's told the exaggerated version of the story for 20 years. We went to a Fenway Park. We went, we saw Pedro. This is when I had no money. We're scalping tickets for Pedro because it was like, I was mm-hmm. like, this will never happen again in my lifetime. And we're there and we're like in the fifth row behind the Red Sox dugout. And I got clam chowder and it was 99. It was during the 99 Pedro season. And right. she's like, I can't eat that. I'm allergic to shellfish. I'm like, come on, just try it. So she tries it. And then she goes, she's like five minutes later, she goes to the bathroom just to go to the bathroom. And she's like, I'll be right back and go to the bathroom. She doesn't come back for like 20 minutes. And I thought like she was getting beer or food or who knows. But more importantly, Pedro was pitching. And it was 99 Pedro. And I'm like, I'm not, right, yeah. I'm not getting up. Like, what, what am I going to go wander <laughs> Fenway Park looking for my wife? I just assumed she was in some food line. She comes back like a half hour later. She was like, I was just in the infirmary. I, I had to take Benadryl. I had a reaction to the oh, clam no. chowder. And I'm like, oh, that's terrible. Oh, my God. I, I, I wish I had known because we don't have cell phones back then. She can't text. And, yeah. and then I'm like, you know, Pedro's throwing like a two hitter. And I, I, I had my focus, like, concerned for her, but also, like, Pedro's Pedro. <laughs> that story has now been twisted over the last 20 years to she had an allergic reaction in the seats. She went off. I didn't go with her because I didn't want to leave Pedro. You know when they, they just kind of they take the kernel of truth and they just blow it out? Yeah, you know, yeah, yeah. you're married. You know like what they do. I better, I have to be honest. You know what they do. <laughs> um, all I right. know what they do. So, What's yours? What's your parent corner? My parent corner, um, I have a special wrinkle. I have a guest to work into my parent corner. Oh. Ben Simmons. Say hi to Sal. Is he there? So, What's happening, Ben? Yeah, this is the first ever parent corner we've done with one of our kids in the parent <laughs> corner. Um, so Valentine's Day, <laughs> Valentine's yeah. Day happened last week. And as you know, uh-huh. young Ben has has a girlfriend, even though he's in the fourth grade, that we've been monitoring. It's a nice, cute, um, innocent relationship. Yeah, yeah. I won't say her name. Don't worry. We'll we'll call her uh, we'll call her Julie Roberts. So no, let's call her by her name. What's her name, Ben? That was all embarrassed. So Ben decides he's going to get um, his girlfriend a Valentine's Day gift. And he's with my mm-hmm. mom, and they buy her something. And then he's in Boston. He's with my stepmom. and decides he needs to get her another gift. Then he gets her a third gift. And then he asks my daughter to make her slime. He made My daughter made her pink slime. So it was all the parent corner worlds are now colliding in all these different ways. Because my daughter is like, you know, a cocaine addict with slime, basically. She's just <laughs> making it nonstop. And then brings this gift. It was a bag with four different gifts. For Valentine's Day to his to his true love, and uh, and needless to say, it went over great. Ben, that was a big win. It was. It was um, one of the best Valentines of my life. <laughs> oh, really? Was one of the best Valentines of his life. Okay. <laughs> I remember back in 2012, you had a good one. But yeah, 20, the, the 2012 confidence. Valentine, though, good co- good cookies that year. <laughs> yeah, so uh, it's stronger than ever, Sal. I don't know. I don't know. I don't know ben, where this, this goes. Is great. And Ben, do you show her pictures of you meeting the other Ben Simmons, or does she not care about that? What? Yeah. Yeah, Ben. ben he yeah. met. Uh, it was the Ben Simmons Summit this weekend at the All Star Game. Happen. Incredible. That's great. So yeah, my parent corner is no matter how young your kids are, if if it's true love, you just got to let it go. You got to let let them spread those wings. <laughs> right, Ben. <laughs> Ben, let, let me give you some advice. It, uh, this is free advice. Find out if she has any shellfish allergies, and if she does, get get rid of her immediately. <laughs> or dairy allergies. She doesn't have any dairy that's allergies, right, right no. Ben? Either one. No. Yeah, that's worse. <laughs> ben, what do you think her favorite thing about you is? I don't know. Um, you get talking to the mic. Maybe because I'm athletic. <laughs> You're athletic? <laughs> I like you so embarrassed. <laughs> wow, what a parent corner. See, people listen to the parent corner. They're like, someday I'll have kids, and this is how it'll play out. Your son will give ben, somebody. Have you tried the RKO on her or any other uh, finishing moves from the WWE? <laughs> Not yet. I don't think the wrestling's a big part of it. 
Uh, yeah, I will say she didn't see on Saturday when he was watching Daddy's Home 2 while playing with 100 wrestling figures. <laughs> probably, not, <laughs> probably not ready for real work yet. Uh, ben, boy. is Daddy... That's good. You made us buy Daddy's Home 2. No, that was Zoe. That was Zoe. Well, one of you owes me $20 because that's one of the worst <laughs> movies that's ever happened. It, it's a great movie. You can't say that. Daddy's Home 2 <laughs> makes Grown Ups... Grown Ups 2 look like Godfather 2. You don't even know what that means. Interesting. No. <laughs> <laughs> what is it? What's it? What's the biggest movie in your house right now for kids' movies, Sal? Well, now it's it's Toy Story three. I don't know why they're all oh. into it again, but Toy yeah, Story. You I, like I, that I, one, B? I love Toy Story. His favorite. Your favorites are Grown Ups one and two. Daddy's Home. I like Grown Ups one more than Grown Ups two, actually. Yeah, incredible. Was that the one with the basketball scene? But yeah. Great basketball scene in that. Okay, Chris Rock really exposed in the basketball scene in, in Grown Ups. Oh, really? Yeah, it's not great for him. It's like Sandler- I get excited. Do you get excited when you, you come across, you stumble across a movie you thought your kids may have seen, and then they're like, no. Nah. Like, I was talking with my son, Archie. I was like, uh, yeah, you remember that line from Airplane? He's like, no, I never saw Airplane. I was like, oh, my God, we have to watch Airplane yeah, tonight. Yeah, yeah. What's good? So yeah, that's when we can watch airplane. We did. We just had that happen four weeks ago with Happy Gilmore. I just uh, assumed uh, that was like one of the first ones we'd ever watched, and we never saw yeah, it. And it was like, oh my god! And it was like really everything Ben wanted from a movie. Yep. Sports. People got hit in the balls. They were swearing. Somebody lost their hand. Chubs. Chubs. Yeah. Um, <laughs> Sal, against all odds, who do you have this week? Uh, it's going to be me and the Degenerate Trifecta. We're going to talk Winter Olympics. We're going to talk the golf tournament. We're going to talk uh, Oscars. And uh, what else happened? Something. There's uh, a lot of, lot going on. I don't know. We're going to talk a lot of stuff. And then next week, we're going to have some uh, ringer experts on to break down the true Oscar categories. Excellent. And then Parent Corner, we're running on this Wednesday. Thanks for coming on, buddy. There you go. Good job by you. Good See job you, by you. Let's talk about Belvedere. Wow. A great one. Produced in one of the world's longest-running distilleries, Belvedere Vodka, the world's finest all-natural vodka. Crafted by a collective of master distillers, Belvedere is made with non-GMO Polish rye, pure water, no additives. Recognized for quality, Belvedere was named the ISC World Vodka Producer of the Year in 2015, 2016, and 2017. Belvedere's unparalleled quality. Reminds me of a run that my favorite basketball player of all time had in the 80s. That's right, Larry Bird won the MVP three years in a row, 84, 85, 86. Won two finals MVPs. And yet somehow his best season was 87. He didn't win anything. But that was a great run. Kind of like what's happening with Belvedere right now. Bird and the Celtics from that era delivered basketball of the utmost quality. Same for Belvedere. Enjoy a delicious cocktail with Belvedere Vodka today. And remember, always drink responsibly. Okay, coming up, my friend Daryl Morey. Got to know him with the Celtics way back when. The Sloan Conference hadn't even really gotten going yet. If it was, it was like in like two classrooms. This year, it's happening in Boston this week. It's now a giant conference, conference center place. Obama's going to be there. I mean, it went from like, I was the keynote speaker to Obama. That's how much this thing has grown. But uh, I put a lot of time and capital and energy into into spreading the gospel for this thing at the end of last decade, early part of this decade. And it's been awesome to watch it blossom as the advanced metrics revolution has not even become a revolution anymore. It's just become something that that is uh, part of the way we follow sports. Every year they celebrate it. They have all these panels, discussions, try to figure out where stuff's going. The best parts are like the little uh, the little side panels in the papers and stuff like that. We found Kirk Goldsberry, um, who became uh, a very popular Grantland writer for us and now works for the San Antonio Spurs. We found him because of the Sloan Conference. So uh, it's really great. I'm really happy for everybody there, him and Jessica Gelman, who he's been running it with since forever. That uh, that everything is peaking this year with Obama. This is an interview I did with him in July. If you remember, he came on my podcast last summer, and we did a whole thing. And after we finished, 
I realized we had never told the story of Daryl. And it's a cool story for a variety of reasons, as you're going to about to hear. But I think the big takeaway, I always get asked from people, you know, how do I get my break? What do I do? Do you have any advice and all that? And the advice is that twofold. One is like, you don't know what your break's going to be. Um, you, you just got to be prepared to work your ass off and roll with it. And, and once you kind of open that door, even one inch, you just got to knock it down. And it doesn't really matter how you do it. And it doesn't matter what vocation it is. Like once you get the sliver of a chance, you got to knock it down. Tate Frazier is a good example. Trying. You're trying. <laughs> you just host a two podcast now. Um, but yeah, Daryl is a good example of like, you never know how your life's going to play out, man. You really don't. Um, but you just got to keep plugging away and, and, and keep your brain moving. Anyway, this is it. This is a really good interview. And what's funny about it is we did this before the rocket season started. Now they've been, you know, they're the one seed in the entire NBA right now. And on top of that, his whole plan of getting Chris Paul and all that stuff, I would say it's worked out. What are they like 29 and one with their best four guys? Yep. So, um, listen to it in the context of that. We taped it like late July, but everything holds. Congratulations to him and Jessica for the Sloan Conference. And here we go. Here's Daryl Moore. Wanted to do the uh, story of Daryl since you were here. Oh, man. I don't know if we'd ever done this. It's a good story. It's, it's a unique one. Yeah. Um, all right. So, starts in Ohio, let's go. where I'm a couple miles from. Yeah, we can skip the childhood. You're, LeBron and Maverick. And, oh yeah, yeah, yeah. You and Maverick were best friends. <laughs> no. So you were slight underachiever, but super smart in high school. What college uh, you went? You went to Northwestern. Northwestern. Yeah. Did Wild well at Northwestern. Think so. Feels like I did. When yeah. did you decide you wanted to get into sports? When I was like eight. Okay. <laughs> so, so you're like me. Yeah. Uh, yeah, reading the Bill James abstracts and was really into baseball um, because, you know, I was a math nerd and yeah. loved numbers. That was the only game. It wasn't like you couldn't download, you couldn't get football stats or anything. Baseball was the only game in town. And uh, so I was really big into baseball stats and all-star baseball with the spinners and uh, Stratomatic. And so what are we talking, early, early 80s here? Early baseball. Yeah, it's mid, mid-80s, towards the end of the 80s. Microleague so. baseball? Any microleague? You know, I didn't play microleague. I played early Weaver baseball in the yeah. Commodore okay. 64 and um, had, a, had a league with my friends. That was a nerdy league. Yeah, this yeah. Is, there wasn't, yeah, it was all male, all male league, as you might it's expect. pre-internet. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Uh, playing fantasy, you know, fantasy baseball and playing, uh, you know, I, I was terrible at baseball. I played basketball, but was really into baseball statistics. So went so, to Northwestern, got a job, got a longer, longer story that I won't tell, but, uh, you know, I found a job nearby in Skokie at Stats Inc., Bill James's firm with John Dewan, the founder there and got, uh, that's, and my wife worked there too. My, my now wife, Ellen. So yeah. So this is mid nineties. You leave the Northwestern, you leave Northwestern, you get a yeah. job at Stats Inc. And at that time, um, they were just like, a baseball firm. Yeah. And I feel like stats had not taken off yet. Not really. Right. Stats got bought later, but it was growing. No, I mean, not even fast. stats, but just in general. Like, oh, in general. No, no. It seemed yeah. like the late nineties. was Baseball when it started, started to really come on. Obviously the founding of Stats Inc. was a big part of that. Um, and, you know, while I was there with Mike Canner, he Mike really started the basketball part of stats, and I, you know, I was entering yeah. by hand like all the ba- basketball statistics, and uh, and then I, you know, I got an opportunity in the '90s to I got part of their basketball book, their first basketball book. And I, I, I have that one. I know, and I put a Carl Malone on the cover. I think. Yeah, and I had a yeah. formula in it. And yeah, oh, that, that wow. was like that was like my first basketball thing. Was what was the formula? Uh, so Bill James had this formula called the Pythagorean baseball formula, which basically take your runs scored and given yep. up, and you can forecast how many wins you should have had from that. And it didn't work in baseball, and no one had really sort of solved how to adapt something like that to basketball. And uh, I, you know, as part of a Northwestern stats class, I basically adapted it to basketball, and it made made the book. So that was my is that it was actually, my first claim to fame. Is yeah. it a good theory? Like, works. does it hold up now? Absolutely. Yeah. It still holds. You just, instead of, instead of the square of your runs, it's to the power of 14. Ah. So, and that was the key. Ah. Yeah. 
So my my history. <laughs> Every, you've stats, lost all your listeners right about now. <laughs> so, uh, my history of stats was I was very early with fantasy sports. Me and my dad were in a baseball league. I think starting in eighty one. That was Whoa. just batting average plus homers. <laughs> what? It's amazing. This is like the worst league ever. <laughs> well, what were we gonna do? There, there was no way to keep track of plus this. Plus homers. It was like that the, was it. So it was like you, warp tops. So basically. if you had like you know Robin Yount and he had three twenty with twenty homers, he was yeah. a three forty. Yeah. So we drafted somebody for every position, and it was like three outfielders. <laughs> And then you had the guys all year, and if you traded them, you, it wasn't even like you had the was old. Was it just set. the American League too, or both leagues? I think it was both leagues. Wow! Ah. But if so, if I traded you Robin Yount for Mike yeah. Schmidt halfway through the year, they just we just swapped the stats, and oh. then next week, yeah, we didn't even because oh. how were we going to compile the right, stats right. from April, May, June? It was it's like, like there's no internet. Calculating the cap, like if you yeah. trade a guy, they just, you switch everything. Right. Got it. Okay. So they would add. So like every once in a while, we'd get this in the mail from somebody. Be like, here are the stats, and it would right. be like your catcher, first base, all these guys, 340, 290, 310. Right. Divide by the number, and that was your team, and then the totals. So the free swingers were great, like Andre Dawson. Like I'm trying to think your league, the guys well, that had a no, decent yeah, no batting OBP, average. no stolen bases. <laughs> no, but like, uh, so I would have changed your rules immediately. You would have kicked me out. What of the were league. you do? These these are my dad's friends. <laughs> yeah, They're yeah, all like yeah. all guys that were at a bar. I know. So I just then, saw your dad at game two against. The, oh yeah, uh, yeah. The, Cavs there, so he's sweating through uh, the Celtics. He was expecting. Yeah, I have... saw him at halftime when uh, Cavs were up seventy-five to thirty-eight. Or... I think he might have left. <laughs> I, don't, I don't know. I, that, that one of those games he left at halftime. He was so disgusted. That was the greatest performance I've ever seen by a player. Yeah, yeah. So, um, so then in the mid '80s, a basketball league started, and Whoa. I think it was one of the. It was called the Larry Bird League. Ironically, I wrote about this a million years ago on ESPN, but these guys. It was something Bird said about how he judged basketball oh, yeah. players. He did points plus three points, points plus rebounds plus assists. That was Larry Bird's thing. Right. I think he might have stole it from Red, maybe. I'm maybe. not sure. Yeah. So this league was points, rebounds, assists, and I think steals and blocks. And nice. just add them all together. Just we called the Larry Bird League. And it Larry Bird, works. of course, was amazing. That was way better than your batting average plus home yeah, runs. No question. <laughs> no question. So then we had that, and that was that became once USA Today started doing the. They remember they would have the Tuesday stats. Yeah, loved it. Poured over. Then you'd have to like by hand like add them on a piece of paper. Oh my god! The they, first they, spreadsheet would be six on hours. Commodore sixty four was like my greatest thing ever. Like, yeah. Uh, so yeah. Well, we the, didn't have anybody like you. I think we had some. Yeah. I think I might have even been doing it. <laughs> so then football, my first one. When was nineteen ninety maybe? No. Nah. And that was. 1991, Fantasy I think. football came earlier. No, you? I'm saying when the, oh, my when first league. Yeah. Yeah, 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 yeah. But all this stuff was the same thing. It was like very primitive info. Because Roto Baseball was like it. late 70s because you had a 30 for 30 yeah. on that. I watched yep. that one. And then basketball came on like mid 80s. And then, uh, and then you know, football, football was, was like late 80s. It yeah. was a little bit later. Yeah, 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 yeah. So then Stats Inc. was really, I remember the first time. I knew about the Bill James stuff. I read the books. Yeah. It didn't Did seem you really. Buy them all? I want to buy them away from you. You got them. Well, right? I got one on eBay. I was, I you was got taunting on eBay you. And I, I got the first offered one. You, I offered you double. No, and you're I was, like, no. I was like, no way. You can offer me 10 tuple. <laughs> like, yeah. So we yeah, have more, first more one. cake than me. So I was like, it's so simple. can't outbid you. <laughs> <laughs> so. It was so simplistic, the, the first abstract. Oh, yeah. No, it was it's like 40 pages. It was pioneering. And, yeah. Uh, if you talk to Bill, he'll credit some other people, but he was the first one to put it on paper. And, and uh, yeah, I mean, it's whenever I, uh, every year, my favorite day of the year almost is I almost always have to go to Lawrence, Kansas for a game. You know, obviously, they have top prospects. And Bill goes to every game and I'll, I'll, I'll have dinner with him. And, and, uh, you know, he, he's, he's now working on like amazing, he had this popular crime, mer, popular it's crime book, which is unbelievable. One of my favorite books of the last it's so 15 good. He years. He saw the Kennedy thing. Yeah. Like, and, uh, he's got another one coming out. I don't think I can say anything about it, but he's got one that's going to be unbelievable when it comes out. So I, the thing that's great about him and is just a good lesson when people always ask, like, how do I break into this business? What's with blah, blah, blah. And it's always like, well, just work harder than everybody else and throw yourself into whatever you're doing. Bill James is the best example of, I have an idea. I'm going all the way with it. Like he does the true yeah. crime book and it's like, it's like 500 pages and he spends 10 years it's on it. And he's like a lunatic with it. He, he, 
I think the best thing I ever heard him say, and it was a non-baseball related thing, I asked him how he got anything, and his insight was like, look, I did poorly in high school because I love baseball and I like goofing around. Yeah. And it was l- literally that's what made my career. You know, he's hilarious in his writing, and his yep. writing's unbelievable, uh, and he loved baseball. So the things that got him in trouble in school are what made him who he is today. So if you have a passion, just chase it. Don't care about your teachers. And and go all in. Don't go yeah, 90%. Exactly. The bummer for me with Bill James is that I just didn't know about him. Yeah, it would he be was hard in the to. back of. I was getting the sporting news back then, and that's how he would advertise. But I would just never knew yeah, about it. It was right next to the guy on the beach getting the yeah. Sand it's like, what up. is that? <laughs> so. And then I remember, like maybe eighty one, seeing in a bookstore, eighty one or eighty two, and be like, "What's that, Dad?" Buy Might me not that. have been a bookstore until a little later. Maybe. I, I saw it somewhere. I because I, I have the well, eight- Boston's a little more progressive, so they have those good bookstores. Ohio, there's nothing where I was at. So we had. Uh, I didn't catch it till eighty six. Actually, the green, the green. I had cover the eighty two one. one, so somehow I That's got amazing. that. Amazing, yeah. I don't well, know Boston if I had has 81. a history of great bookstores, so they probably they might have carried it actually, yeah. Because the oh, the the uh, quality of them goes up. I had to hope the Walden books would have something. Like- Walden books, oh my god, remember those <laughs> down at Summit Mall? And- yeah. <laughs> so, so stats takes off. Yeah, and the internet changes everything. Yeah, and now all of a sudden, loads of statistical information are going up and are changing how we're following sports at the same time. Billy Bean, Moneyball, all yeah. that starting. And I'm then- desperate leaving stats because I couldn't, you know, it was a very low paying job. I was like, I, you know, I can't make whatever forever. So I tried to get a job in sports. Not a single person made, said anything. This was in 96. You're writing like letters and stuff? What are you oh, doing? Right. I sent a letter to every team, you know, here's what I hope to do, blah, blah, blah. No answer, of course. Um, which I, I wouldn't answer my own letter. So right. it's fine. <laughs> um, and then just desperate to get into sports. So I I basically said, hey, I'm going to have to be super rich. Like, that's my only chance was I have to be super. So then I went on to do stuff that had no chance to make me super rich. I like I was at like a pharmaceutical firm. I was at, uh, you know, a, a, a company that called MITRE that works with the NSA and CIA. Um and then I decided to go to business school, which is also a terrible idea to get rich. But it's I got lucky, got into a consulting firm, and that firm ended up working on the Red Sox deal before John Henry bought it. And that oh, was okay. that was my 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 key because the group that was going to buy them, the local owners, uh, Carp and O'Donnell, I remember who actually outbid yeah Henry. Um, I was like the nobody working on that team. And but they kicked to me a part of the project, which was like they wanted to buy the Red Sox and Celtics together and then create a, a I cable. Remember. Yeah. yeah. And, and that was he, a great and, idea. By yeah. The way. And yes, was just doing the same thing. Yeah. And so I got that piece of the project. And then, of course, they didn't get the bid. I'm, I'm ready to jump off the building. And it wasn't but that was always shady how they didn't get the bid either. Oh, it was how the how somehow the highest bid doesn't the highest win the auction. Bid, yeah. And you know, the reality was my memory was, you know, the our group wouldn't promise they would support their one of their proposals for I think revenue sharing. And so it was a I Bud think, Selig. Yeah, he yeah, he greased it. I don't it know. I, I was the nobody in the project. No, so that's Bud just Selig. what I heard. Yeah. Um and then basically, you know, Wick, uh, who I really owe so much to, was, you know, had had gone to the Celtics and put a bid down, uh, but had like a, a one or two week due diligence period. And then Steve Paliuka, who knew the CEO of our firm Parthenon where I was at, um, you know, basically said, Hey, we need to analyze this deal fast. And I think Steve, you know, knew Wick and told Wick, Hey, this group's already done really good analysis. And so uh, that's how I got on the Celtics group you know, helping Wick to potentially buy the Celtics. And that was really my in. So, I mean, that's a total fluke in a lot of ways. In, in many ways. Yeah. That's you know amazing. how things, you know, you like to think you're ready for the opportunity. Cause I had worked at stats and was such yeah. a huge sports fan and into all that. But, you know, I know some amazing people, I'm sure you do too, who just have never gotten that, that one little opening chance. We well, to- basically had two because just randomly the Red Sox and Celtics are selling at the same time during right. the perfect time for you to yep. be involved. Yep. 
And if it's five years later, neither of those teams are for sale. Yeah, I mean, I when people ask, I get asked all the time, like, "Hey, I want to get into sports. What do I do?" And I'm like, well, yeah. I, I don't know. Like, like just just be passionate, and 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 when your break comes, Jump be ready to pounce. I will say, you know, working with Wick's team and Steve Pelyuka's team on that deal, like my wife thought it was crazy. I literally wouldn't come on. We were we were working twenty out of twenty four hours around the clock, and when you see that little crack in the door, just plow through. Like, don't yeah. – uh, you cannot, like, treat it like it's 9 to 5 at that point. Like, you have to stand out. And I still remember to this day, Wick, like, day three into it, we were giving a presentation, and, and he and he turned to me and he was like, you know, you'd look really good in green. I still remember that moment. That was, like, one of the big moments of my life. Wow. And, uh, and, so he uh, just – he there was something about you that he liked – and he's I, like, we got to just fold this guy in somehow. You have to ask him. Yeah, and that's actually usually a taboo thing. Like, you're not supposed to hire people away. But uh, I always thank Bill Ackmeyer, the head of Parthenon, who, you know, gave, you know, permission to maybe have me join the Celtics. So, so. did they say, like, carve out what your dream, like, if you're going to help the Celtics, how would you help us? Yeah, I mean, I didn't really care. In fact, I think Wick almost didn't hire me because I was like desperately at like 3 a.m. saying like, I really want to be there. Right. Right. And finally, he sent, I remember he sent me an email back like, hey, chill. Right. Like, it's going to be fine. Like, I, I, I was acting very like a 20-year-old during that. I was I was very, uh, it was, I knew it was maybe my break. And yeah. so I like was, did not act rationally and it was very desperate. And uh, um, yeah, and then, and then, you know, Wick, just had me like work on different things at the Celtics. And then he brought in, he brought in Danny Ainge and Rich Gotham. And I, you know, I was, I was pretty young. So I, you know, it was appropriate for them to bring in more experienced guys. And uh, I just worked with both of them for a few years. So when did you become like the advanced metrics guy for the Celtics? Uh, I mean, I always like that was the thing. And then, uh, you know, I hired Mike Zarin, who's yeah. obviously almost a legend in the industry now. Uh, he was in, I hired him as an intern and he was working, I think at the 12th circuit in Columbus, like like yeah. one of the obvious, probably the smartest guy I know. And he's, uh, and then he actually ended up getting to work more on basketball than me because he, he just was an intern full time. Uh, and I was like splitting my time between helping with the business side and the basketball side. And yeah, so that, and, and then somehow, some way, like my next big break was when uh, Carol Dawson was retiring in Houston. Uh, he, you know, he, he uh, uh, our owner Leslie Alexander was like looking for a new GM, and he had been looking for a while, which I didn't know. And but he was looking for someone different. Uh, he, you know, he was obviously watching the trends of information and Billy Bean, and he had interviewed, I think. I mean, he'd have to say, but I think he'd interviewed five, six, seven people and didn't like them. He just the, didn't want to fire the old school no. GM, the former player. Well, Leslie's been uh, way ahead of his time for years, like on the pace and space and who he's hired and, I mean, everything. And, you know, I I was helping a, a headhunter, Buffy Philippel, giving. She was, like, trying to find someone to help fit the job. So I was helping her for, like, six months saying, hey – because I didn't think I was necessarily ready. Honestly, I'd just been at the Celtics for, I think, three years. And I was like, hey, what about this? What about that? And then finally she was like, hey, he wants to meet you. And I was like, oh, <laughs> okay. Yeah. I mean, I found out on like a Tuesday and I was interviewing two days later at 9 a.m. And and, and I had the job by like two o'clock that, that day. So Let's go backwards. Yeah. So you're at the Celtics. It's like, this is your life here, sort of, Bill. Yeah, a little yeah. bit. That's what I told you it was going to be. Um, you're at like 04, 05 range. They're revamping the team. They have a bunch of cap space issues because they had traded for Vin Baker's contract. That turned out to be a disaster. Then I they worked had a to, lot on the Vin Baker thing. Yeah, actually, yeah, yeah. Then Rafe LaFrance, like he comes in, he's got a yep. big contract. Paul Pierce had a big contract. And they were kind of in salary cap hell for four or five years. The Celtics fans were, we were beside going, themselves. We were going nuts. Because not only was the team not good enough, and it had been many years since you had last won the title, uh, they, you know, everyone knew they were just locked in. Like, yeah. Because there's no flexibility under the cap and everything. So, yeah, the Vin Baker thing was one of the big things I worked on. 
and Mike Zarin worked on it, and obviously Danny did early. So just trying to figure out what just to do. Trying with to it. figure out because like he he obviously was had going through some personal troubles at the time, and it was just how do we create a win win for him and the Celtics at that time. So uh, I hear he's doing well. At when this did point. um when did you start looking at different ways to evaluate players? Did that start at the Celtics? I mean, that started Stats Inc. In okay, like ninety. So like at the yeah. Celtics. Because you're dealing with all this old school way of thinking and this and this guy. No, he's a good shooter because that's his field goal percentage. <laughs> well, I remember one big thing on that was uh, Coach O'Brien was a coach who's obviously a very good coach. And, and uh, you know, he was he was talking about how the defense was number one in the league. And, and he was looking at defensive raw field goal percentage. And and uh, I was actually working with Frank Vogel, Frank Vogel, yeah. the head coach. And uh he was, I think, the the fourth assistant, maybe maybe third or fourth assistant at the time, and I was he and Frank and I was really smart, and I, and so was Coach O'Brien, and, and I was walking through like, hey, you know, that's not like you're we're really not number one. You realize that, and yeah, and it turned out they were number one in defensive field goal percentage, but we were like actually eleventh in overall defense measured the right way, which is really you know DER. Yeah, right? the yeah. rating. Yeah. Um, and, you know, actually one of the tough meetings was me meeting with Coach O'Brien early and saying like, okay, yes, you are number one in field goal percentage. That's, you know, but you also are giving up the most open threes in the league. So, yeah, like you can't, we can't be packing the paint this much because like these threes are, are sort of killing you. He would front the post. So, yeah, again, defensive field goal percentage is low because no one got any like close in post-ups. But the reality was we were really low on defensive rebounding because people get inside position. So our defensive rebounding percentage was was really bad. Then we also had sort of a no layups attitude. So even if anyone got a layup, we would just foul them. So yeah. of course, the only shots that actually happened were these like you know were either shots outside of six feet. If you're inside six feet, we were fouling you, and then we're basically giving up inside position on rebounding. And so when you adjusted for all that, I, you know, it was basically like, yeah, we're not first. We're like 11th. Yeah. And like, and coach O'Brien, you know, he's great. He was like, yeah, that's not, yeah, yeah that's, that's not good. <laughs> so, you know, what's interesting about O'Brien yeah. is those Celtic teams he had when he took over from Patino were kind of a prototype for how basketball is being played. Now it was just with terrible three point shooters, but they were jacking Absolutely. up 25, 26 threes a game and getting to the line. The late 90s Celtics team was one of the most unique ever. They were turning people over. They were playing pressure, up-tempo, yeah. and it was really innovative. The problem was they were giving up way too many layups on the other end. It just yeah. it just didn't work, and I don't think for 48 minutes like the superstars of the league really can play that kind of basketball. But it, it was really it's probably the last most innovative team that's been put on the floor in a long time. It's it's not quite a thirty for thirty. It's like kind of a <laughs> half ass thirty for thirty, but but I mean there was one year Antoine, I think in the playoff shot like eight threes a game. Yeah. And yeah. was just that was what they were well, gonna again, do. Yeah, Coach O'Brien knew none of them were going in. New threes were good. I mean, yeah. he was way up there on knowing three was worth more than two, which is why one of our I was having a discussion with Frank Vogel a lot was like if you know it's good on offense, you got to know it's bad on D. Like you, yeah. you, that that whole marriage hadn't happened yet because people were still running like Dick Harder type defensive concepts, and 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 a lot of those end up giving up more open threes. And you know, like it wasn't until recently now you get the switching with long range of p. The the offenses have, offenses have adjusted faster than the defenses to the modern game, right. and you're only now seeing like the coaches really adjust to how the offenses are playing. So could you feel like setting up this, how the Rockets thing happened when things started shifting, money ball comes out. Um, the advanced metrics thing is now becoming like this real touch point in sports journalism. Yep. How should we measure players? There's this new way to do it. The old school guards fighting back. This is wrong. Who are the nerds? Screw these guys. And I remember we were in Houston at All Star Weekend. I, yeah. I didn't know you that 06. well. Yeah, um, but I knew you, and we, my buddy Sully, freezing cold, in MVP Houston. of my wedding, yeah. Sean Sullivan, and yeah. we were out at the Four Seasons Hotel. And I was telling you you're going to be a GM, and you were like, "No, I'm not." And I'm like, <laughs> "It's going to happen. One of these owners is going to." I know. He's going to look you at this and say. You literally predicted 100%. I did. I remember it. It's, listen, I'm wrong a million times. This is one of the times where <laughs> yeah. I was like, one of these owners is going to yeah. be like, I want my Billy Bean. And I'm like, who's around the league? Who's like you? 
And there wasn't really there wasn't that many, one. right? I mean, At that Mike, point, Mike is the other guy. He's going to get a job. As well, well, Mike's been offered jobs yeah, a million I know. times. He's probably well smart, now. There's now there's a lot them of them now, though. Uh, there's a lot of like say, advanced yeah, metrics yeah. based. Up, up, yeah, exactly, exactly. But yeah. in 06, there wasn't. You know what else I remember in that four seasons? I I had had too many. You were overserved. Is I the was other part I remember. Yeah. And you saved me from like going up to a very I, I key made you leave. executive. Yeah, I made you I leave. I almost embarrassed myself completely, and you yeah. saved me. So, uh, well, that you were might, feeling you might have killed my GM chance right there. <laughs> so, you could have. Yeah. But that was the yeah, that was like the big power hotel. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, the, everything was happening there. Like, yeah, David Falk and one. Jordan quarter, was playing Jordan. Uh, Bou Ray. Bou Ray. <laughs> yeah. uh, oh, but uh, yeah, and then like three months later, all of a sudden, it was three months later, you're going in, right. yeah. and everybody's like. It was actually Rockets, two months later, if you can believe it. Because it was February and I got oh, hired yeah. in April of 06. Yeah. So everybody's like, the Rockets hired a guy who didn't coach or play basketball? Uh, our poor who the CEO, hell is this guy? Our poor CEO now, like Tad Brown, all the all the press hit of of the negativity of of you know our owner, Leslie Alexander, hiring me like hit and he's just dealing with like the radio guys calling me deep blue and like yeah they're like they're calling the owner crazy and and like he had to deal with all that and uh because i was like behind the scenes like it wasn't like right it wasn't like i was like known or anything around the league i was like mike was maybe 10 years ago right yeah and so yeah the owner i'll, I'll never forget the the risk you know the the personal risk the owner took to give me a shot it was amazing so you come in and you realize that you have two of the best players in the league in your team, which is an advantage. That was nice. And I didn't realize how Including much. Tracy, who is like one of the early advanced metrics, painted him as much better than maybe oh, the traditional ones. Absolutely. In fact, people were debating him or Kobe for yeah. a while. Like there I still a, think his ceiling was higher than Kobe's. Tracy had two years better than Kobe yeah. ever had. Pro like just on individual accolades, yeah. obviously. Um, I also don't think Kobe could have ever won 22 straight games with that Houston team. I still think that the, the, what T-Mac did with that team is T incredible. Mac literally made that happen. Yeah. Like he, you had seven guys. My The moment I remember from the 22-game running streak more than any is where at win number 17 and Carl Landry goes down. Because we had lost Yao at game 11. Yeah. Carl Landry goes down. People don't realize Carl was his rookie year. He was like just dominating, like just killing and I'm like, oh, well, this is over. Like, freaking Carl. I mean, he was key. I talked to Tracy, and we had just signed Mike Harris out of Rice. Yeah, good, I remember him. Really, really good player, still playing in China. Uh, and uh, and I'm like, Tracy, man, with us, Carl Landry. He's like, what's wrong? And I was like, yeah, he's been great for us. He's like, well, I'm making him great. Like, Mike Harris will be just as good. Don't worry. <laughs> Wow. <laughs> and like he was right. Like yeah. Mike Harris said, like this amazing stretch of like five games before we finally lost to the, the eventual champion Celtics that year. So T Mac. He's, so, yeah, he's no. the lost career of that decade. T Mac T Mac made so many people better. Yeah. I mean he his people forget his passing was absurd. Like, you know, he, James now is like on his level or maybe you, you could say better. But like both I've been blessed to have two superstars who are like ridiculous passers, so do you think uh, I was a defender for T Mac Hall of Fame? I actually thought he was underrated. The, Peak level, you can't argue. Yeah, it. yeah he was the, the best demeanor player. that he had as a superstar. Do you feel like he was as cutthroat as he needed to be? I, I think it. I think it hurt it that people thought he wasn't. I mean, go back and look at all his playoff statistics. They were unbelievable. He's one of those guys who got better in the playoffs. I respect those guys. Yeah, you know, you know. Dwight Howard, who people you know like to beat up now, he you look at his playoff run with us. He is on every year unbelievable. So yeah. you look, almost every player gets like ten to twenty percent worse in the playoffs. The guys who get better are the ones you want on your team, and Tracy was that. What did you think were the big inefficiencies when you took over that quickly got closed? Because it seems like I mean, shooting three pointers was. I mean, that one, uh, that one's still coming. But like that was such an easy inefficiency, and and now everyone's catching up. That was simple one. You know, I'd say like obviously the inefficiency of you know paint, you know paint, shots outside of the paint, not threes. I think that one's pretty close. What about for like how much success you had in the draft those first couple of years? Like, what, oh yeah, what using, was... using draft models. Yeah, I mean we had you know obviously Brooks, you know Aaron Brooks picked late twenties, Carl Landry picked thirty one that year. You know even 
even on to like uh you know guys like even chandler parsons and stuff but you know our draft board ends up getting you know the the league is way more efficient in the draft now too so you like you really valued college production back then more than other teams more than other teams i think teams like the spurs were always really smart spurs were obviously yeah. way ahead on international guys yeah that's caught up that that was a big advantage that got closed and then then the league overcorrected with like skittish Vili and yeah, you know yeah, yeah. and darko and stuff like that and so I actually think we may be in a little bit of an overcorrection on using analysis now because you'll see us sign guys, you know, like Chris Paul's one of, like one of the best mid range shooters ever. Like, you know, am I am I am I worried he's going to take mid range? No, because uh, he's really good at him and it's going to add uh, a good aspect to our offense. So um, I, I would say there might not be an overcorrection or people using maybe numbers a little bit too much. So I, I'm hoping that will help us for a little while. Uh, that you know that 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 you know overreaction almost like the international players yeah that was probably the flaw of your team last year was you you abandoned the mid-range completely and then san antonio said we're giving you 18 footers we dare you to take them i i would hate to go as far as flaw yeah. um i do think you want to be every team has a flaw I, yeah oh of course that's a good point yeah i do think you want to be have multiple threats from especially going against very good playoff defenses you want to have multiple threats all over the floor and multiple aspects to your offense. And that's a big reason we're excited about Chris. I, I'm shocked people. A lot of the arguments are like, you know, is the fit there and things like that. And they remind me of the articles on when Durant joined Golden State. Go back and look. Yeah. You can find all these articles like how they shouldn't have done it. And it's there. They were obviously absurd. And the articles on us and whether or not James and Chris can work, I think are pretty crazy. I think too. the only thing is the usage rate thing. That was my biggest fear of it yep. is that it's two guys that succeed the most when they have the ball. Right. And, and my Curry point, plays off the ball. So that the sharing the ball thing, I always thought it was going to hurt like Clay Thompson the most. Here's why it'll work. Like either next to Chris or James, you need, you need guys who can, who can shoot. Like the fact that both of them shoot at a very high rate is pretty key. Yeah. Uh, and then obviously Chris, uh, being a very, very good defender is also key. So uh, both of them work off the ball really well, uh, even though they're two of the best all time on the ball. So I, I, we're very comfortable at a work. I mean, just look at USA basketball. They, they, you know, I was going to say, they, yeah. when you have two of the best 15 guys in the league, when the or USA whatever. basketball team's up 40, no one's like, oh, I wonder if it'll work with, right. uh, you know, whether, you know, Steph, James, and, you know, Chris Paul can work. Yeah, it works pretty well. Yeah, they're all. The other thing is they're both extremely smart players, so they're going to adapt. They're going to adapt to each other really well. So the uh, going back to the late two thousands, the the model that you had, the draft model, yeah. which I always used to make fun of you. Well, about. you got to give a lot of credit to Mike Zarin as well. We we yeah. had an early version, and then Mike came in and really uh, really took it to the next level. Did you feel like other teams figured out what the model was eventually? Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, teams have caught up. Because I figured um, it out in like three years. Yeah, we feel. I used to send you texts making fun of people. <laughs> I know. People you were like, you're taking bottom. this guy. You were always right. Yeah. <laughs> so, Mike and I try to predict each other's picks every year. It's pretty yeah. funny. Um, yeah, no, I, most, I mean, we obviously feel like we're farther ahead, but it, yeah, the, the edge is much smaller. Like the, the difference between better model and slightly better model is way different than better model no model right? right so so that edge is really eroded and and you know we're having to adapt and our thinking have, has adapted as well in the mid 2000s late 2000s too you guys did a lot of some of the stuff you're doing with like where guys like to make shots on the floor mm -hmm. and this guy's great from this spot and he's not good from this spot not a lot of teams were doing that back then right no, yeah, and I th I think that's caught up too. That's yeah, caught a lot up. of the, that helps defenses a lot. Obviously. Yeah, more maybe more than offenses, and uh, a lot of that it really advanced work on scouting reports, um, and and our, you know and having a coaching staff that knows how to use it that's 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 still coming as well. Um, but we have, yeah I have a great coaching staff now. Even though Mike obviously is far along in his career. He's always been a pioneer. Yeah. And uh, he surrounded himself with, you know, great assistants who are also very, very forward thinking guys. So the most controversial trade you made early that people killed you on was Battier for gay. 
Yes. You could have taken Rudy Gay. You could have drafted him. What was that, 2006? We actually were going to take Tabo Cephalosha, not even Rudy Gay. Oh, you like, weren't even going to take Rudy yeah, Gay? Yeah, wow. I wasn't technically in charge, so it was uh, Carol Dawson was still the GM. Hmm. Um, and uh, Dennis Lindsay was there. He's gone on to be unbelievable with Utah, as you know. And yeah, I think, I mean, honestly, I don't know for sure who Carol was going to take, but uh, as far as I could tell, we were on the pace to take Tabo. To Carol's credit, he was trying to move up to get Brandon Roy. He had yeah. that really pegged really well. And, uh, and if, you know, but we were going to take Tabo actually. And wow. Uh, so yeah. But we, you were pushing for Battier, right? Your whole staff I was, was. pushing for Shane because yeah. we, we felt like with Yao and Tracy in their prime, Shane was like, it was actually really hard to enter the ball to Yao. We needed yeah. a guy who could be a defender next to Tracy, and we needed a guy who had height and could shoot the three and could enter the ball to Yao. And honestly, we needed a great, an extra culture guy who was going to be good. So we were, we pushed hard for that. And honestly, yeah, analytically, that's actually not a good move. Um, hmm. But we felt like analytically we because of what? Uh, I think. You generally can get more value at the eighth spot than you maybe could get, but we felt like because he had a long contract with people didn't like, but we liked that he had like yeah. another five years on his deal uh, from Memphis, and we felt like it was the perfect fit. I, I think it ended up being right uh, when you go back, but um, I would say if you ask like the Sloan Conference. Should you trade the eighth pick for Shane back then? I bet like 80% would say don't do it. Yeah, like what would be the equivalent now? It would be like if the Knicks traded – the eighth pick for who? Yeah. Um, I probably I might not be able to use current players, but it would be like, you and know, maybe, who's a perfect. I'm trying to think of a current player. Well, I can tell you one. So PJ Tucker would be like trading an eighth pick for like a perfect right. win the title glue guy. Like, yeah, you know, yeah. we obviously think PJs can do that for us. Yeah. So, but that, that was a weaker be... draft too, though, the 06. This, this draft uh, now is Yeah, better. it had all, Aldridge. It had, uh, it was it was a tough draft to nail the picks. You know, Bargnani went first. I think that Ty year. Thomas was involved. Ty Thomas was two, and then there was like a yeah the Portland Celtics Chicago traded the Street. Randy Foy pick for Sebastian Telfair. Uh, that, that was rough. Yeah, did we? I don't remember doing that. Oh that was, yeah, that was a different year, wasn't no, it? No, that was 06. Well, we didn't. Did we get Telfair? They know. they flipped it for. Uh, oh, we retraded Telfair, maybe. Yeah. No, we got that. We got I the, think you're mixing years. I don't remember. Foy was in that draft, though. That's right. No, no, that was the draft. Huh. And they ended up, they had, like, I think maybe it was LaFrance's contract, which they flipped oh, for no, no, Serbiak's contract. In you were gone at I that was point. Already in yeah, you yeah, were yeah. gone. So this could have all happened. I, yeah, I, yeah. I was like, man, I don't remember that. No, the draft you were in, yeah, that yeah. was the great Celtics what if, was when Danny really wanted Robert Swift and offered the two first round picks. And Seattle said no, and they had to settle for Al Jefferson, who ends up being in the KG trade, which is the 2008 title. You I'll, need to get I'll lucky I, with these things. I was in the room, but I don't think I can comment on the whole the whole thing. But, but yeah, that's what obviously happened. getting Al Jefferson was was huge, and I didn't know Al Jefferson from anything. If I had any role back then, it was just doing working on the college model and not the high schoolers. Right. So. I think that was 04. Uh, yeah, that was. You need 04. to get lucky sometimes. You hey, really do. I mean, you got to give credit to Danny for nailing the pick. You, you know, yeah. whether or not Robert Swift was the guy they wanted, he still nailed the pick. What, this it's was the, 14 years ago. You're acting like, what, what is Danny Ainge going to find you? <laughs> that was the story. They wanted Robert Swift. Uh, hey, man, maybe if he goes to Boston, maybe his career is different. Who knows? Robert Who Swift knows was someone that, that Danny Ainge wanted. That's correct. Yes. Well, he learned his lesson. Now he knows to go for game. But, but, but here's the thing. That's hindsight. Like, Robert Swift could have worked out. Like, no one knew at the time. This is the problem with the draft. Yeah. And the, the, my issue that I've always gotten in trouble with, with guessing with guys, high schoolers, foreign guys. There's just no way to know. Like, Frank, Nidal Frank Nidalinka, who you can't talk about because he's on another team. But it's like, he went eighth over Malik Monk, and I went crazy because I love Malik Monk, and I just think he's going to be a great pro. And I don't know with this guy who was in France who was averaging four points a game in France. Maybe the upside's higher. But if I'm picking eighth, I want to make sure I get somebody, you know? That's one night, one how nice I'm thing wired. about, you know, never picking high because, you know, our right. worst record yeah, ever is 41. That's like, it, it is, you know, those picks like six through 12. I mean, ugh. so here's the thing. Here's the hard thing. It's really not fair to the GMs who pick there. Like, let's say you pick five, right? Yeah. The owners don't judge, like, did you get a good pick at five relative to other fifth picks in history, which is, you know, a shockingly low rate make it. I think only yeah. like 40% end up being pretty good. 
They judge it like, is the fifth pick better than the next 55 picks? You have no chance being next. Almost no chance. Yeah. Being, your odds of at the fifth pick being net better than the next 55 are like 3% or 4 I'm making numbers up now. I didn't analyze it, but it's a really low damn percentage. So, like, you're you're almost screwed picking five, six, seven. You like. I remember when I did the 2013 draft for ESPN, so I really threw myself in the draft. Right, right, I, right, I knew right. everybody. I think you interviewed the guy. Oh, yeah, we did the job that, yeah. interview. Right. So I really had hardcore opinions. Was that Grantland or was it ESPN? It was Grantland and yeah, ESPN, yeah. 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 And uh, and I remember thinking like, because you were in Chicago interviewing guys. We went Chicago. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I was telling you my experience after, and I was yeah. like, I like this guy. I like this guy. Yeah, this guy yeah. scared me. But um, but I remember leaving that draft going, man. I don't know who the number one pick from this draft, or the best guy from this draft six years from what now is going to be. Thirteen draft. Who was who? so it was Giannis. Oh, yeah. so Giannis is in that draft. I remember yeah. we Jalen and I both really like C.J. McCollum. Yep. Yeah. Um, who ended up going tenth? I I he liked was a good Oli- interview. I really good liked interview. Oladipo. Yeah, he was a great interview. But Giannis, we're studying these YouTube clips, and Jalen's convinced it's like nine foot rims. We're watching these like hazy Greek YMCA videos, and he just looks much bigger than anyone else. And we're like, we're talking to Fran Frisella, like Frisella. Yeah, and we're like, how does anyone know if Giannis is going to be good at basketball? Like, yeah, there's. I saw him live twice, once in a practice in Greece. Yeah. Our international scout Mar- Marco did a great job identifying him. And like, you know, he was there with his two brothers, younger brother and his older brother. And I mean, he he looked amazing, but like how, what am I supposed to do with that? Like it's just right. like a practice basically. And then I saw him like most of the league saw him there was Treviso International Camp and you had to drive like 2 hours you could go see him on the national team play a game right around that time in june and i saw him there that was it live saw a lot of video real tough i mean i was actually really surprised philly didn't take him because um they ended up taking the rookie of the year so they did fine but but because he was like this super high upside for the process yeah we had had bet that he might take him because we were like super high upside may as well go for it we didn't know we thought schroeder was going to be the first like guy foreign guy Mm -hmm. In that range. Yeah. I, I saw him live and yeah. Giannis felt like he was going to go like somewhere between 18 and 22. And and yet you kind of felt like somebody might take a swing at him. Yeah. And then he went 15. And, yeah. John but that's Ham- the thing. So John now Hammond that's. did a great job. Yeah. yeah so that's the number one guy in that but thing. He, yeah. He, yeah. And that's, that goes it's back to your point It's actually been a really though. interesting period lately. Though I think the last five or seven drafts have actually gotten players outside the lottery that are, are just near franchise outside guys. that have been franchise guys, which is super rare when you when you look back. Prior to that little set with, you know, those guys, there was like it was really just like maybe one or two ended up being like even all stars outside of maybe pick twenty. So Yeah, because like Kawhi at fifteen, that was another big one. Uh Go Bear. Who gets sold? The go that draft, no one had right. Like if you you'd like was that in- Jokic too? Nah, that nah. was later. But if you invert, like if you invert that draft, you almost pick better. If you go thirty to one, <laughs> right? Yeah, invert that draft. Like go back and look. It's crazy. Yeah. Like that. I, I I talked about this in the Michael Lewis piece. That draft, I think was like the one I was off the most. Like, like really? yeah, I think it was that one. I don't remember. Jokic was another one. I mean, it does seem like every year there's at least one guy outside the top. My favorite is we, and we did it with Chandler Parsons. And I think it happened with Jokic. Cause I think that other picks and I think even uh, Bob Myers has been humble about the Draymond pick that they had picks ahead of it. Like didn't take. So them, like yeah. actually our owner is super smart. Leslie came to me after we picked Chandler 38 that year, and he was obviously like one of the top five guys in the league till he got hurt. I mean, from that draft till he got hurt. And um, he, we had two picks ahead of it. And like uh, Leslie, our owner, was like, you guys really messed up. And, 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 and I was like, what? He's like, yeah, you, like, yeah, you had two picks ahead. We could have lost Chandler. You know, we could have lost him. And I was like, would you believe I knew he'd make it to 38? <laughs> right. <laughs> and, he, and he was like, no. I was like, no, you shouldn't believe it. Because I, I didn't know. Yeah, so. Did I mean, you feel, um, do you feel a bias like those first few years with the GM? With like the, were the GMs condescending with you? Or how'd that go the you first know what? couple no, years? No, it, it, the GMs, I would say the big difference is when we 
compared to like baseball because you know the baseball guys from the analytics that were coming in and like telling everyone that they, they were wrong everything's wrong right yeah and so that was a tough sell when when by the time basketball really started looking at analytics a lot of our analysis was like making coaches feel better because like guys like Shane Battier, they average like eight points and five rebounds, but coaches loved him. They're like, I think this guy's really helping. Yeah. A lot of the advanced analytics said like guys like Shane are worth a lot more than you think. So you, so when you have a message that's more like, Hey, you're right, but here's a few areas where you could improve. That's different than like, you've been wrong your whole life. You idiot. <laughs> like that was baseball. Yeah. So the basketball integration was a little bit easier because a lot of the coaches were, you know, you knew that points, rebounds, and assists wasn't really a great way to evaluate players. They just knew it. And and then now these new things like adjusted plus minus and things like that were saying the same thing. They believed. So that Do you helped. believe in chemistry more than you did twelve years ago? Because we yeah. this is our this has been our biggest argument over the years. <laughs> I do. I especially I would say I would nuance. So when you have a team like we have, you know, trying to win the title, chemistry is really like I I did probably underrate it. Um, I still don't think it's important when you're like, you know, when, when you're, you're awesome, when you're Philly. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Oh, I got, I got you. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. It's like people worry about, you know, like, uh, when Phil, I'm not saying Philly now, but I'm saying Philly when, when Sam was there, like he was getting beat up for not worrying about chemistry. Like if you're going to win 15 games, like that, does it really matter how you do it? Like, I mean, <laughs> like, so but I, I do, yeah. I, luckily, it all starts with your best player, and James has been uh, a great leader, and I've been blessed that way. But yeah, we, I probably, especially when the team's really good, I focus on it a lot. So when you started getting um, attention, notoriety, I nicknamed you lovingly Dork Elvis. I know, I love Song Conference. Name. Yeah. You become. It was like your Trump nickname for me. Or something. <laughs> it was endearing. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, and the song conference takes off and you become kind of the face of the basketball analytics movement. Did you feel like there was resentment from the other GMs? Cause I always heard, I always heard like people were like, all right, enough of this Daryl Morey. We, we've yeah. had it. I mean, they're right. There should, you know, I, so should, would you I, have should, I should, it back? I should shut up more. I mean, that's just true. I you just, don't say you've been better lately. No, but my personality as I'm, yeah, people like, expect me to be one thing i'm very i'm different than what anyone expects and like they think i'm going to be like just a very imper you know introverted guy i'm not yeah and uh and so yeah i think i think my yeah i think i'd talk too much but you know it is i think you just, talk you might have done too much in the past i don't think okay. i think you have the right balance as long now. as i'm on the bill simmons show it's fine no just, it's you've, you've had nice how many big interviews have you done you haven't done that many anymore not, not 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 many so i think kyle i almost feel like this is like bs podcast worthy i don't know if i want to give this to the ringer nba show i might just have to save this <laughs> for like three weeks from now vernon's gonna be mad yeah man. screw <laughs> screw that guy i'm gonna keep this for myself um the uh I, I do think there's a balance. I think like Sam, who I know you're friends with and yeah. I know him well too. I thought he became too kind of Howard Hughes-ish and I think it hurt him. I think he could have been out there a tiny bit more and massaged the media a little bit better. Well, if you know it's going to end, how it's going to end, he would say for sure. I think he felt like he had ownership support there to execute on the plan and part of the plan was – to you know not be as out there especially during the down times yeah and you know they obviously that was the sam can be more communicative it's just he thinks it's better for the team especially at that point for, i don't need to defend him he could come on it, especially at that point when he was there it didn't make sense to be that community i and that said like if he knew that he didn't have the support that he thought he had I'm sure he would have been out there more, right? I yeah. mean, like, because he's pretty good too. No, he is. You know, I, th he, I think he, he could have handled he, it. He he absolutely could have, and uh, you know, hopefully uh, someone will give him a shot. He could obviously help. I think a lot of teams. So, do you see more teams imitating that? A hundred percent. Like, especially uh, Golden State's like a juggernaut, man. Like, if you if you don't have, I mean, like we're trying to close that gap, and we got James Harden and Chris Paul, and we're hoping to be a 60-win team. That's a huge bar in the West. I think the West is going to be strong. Normally, if you could get to a 55-60-win team, that gives you a real shot to win the title. Yeah. Now, like, if we win 60, we're still going to be, like, one in 
six at best probably in Vegas. Usually that's like almost a 40% chance. You're 15 to one odds right now. Yeah. That's depressing, man. Why would you? Yeah. So are we really 15 to one right as we sit here? I yeah. thought we might get to like at least 10 no, to one. No, you're 15 to one. Which you know, book? Which, which all one? All of them. People believe in the Warriors. Yeah, I understand. I mean, they yeah. have the second best player in the league who might even be the first best player in the league in 12 months. And they have one of the best shooters of all yeah, time. Yeah, we don't and need to go through this. Draymond Green's really good, and <laughs> they brought everyone back, and I, I mean, would say it's a problem. We got James Harden in his prime. You know, we're going for it. So, but Chris I, Paul? I, as I said before, like, look, you've been in sports long enough. There have been way bigger upsets than, you know, and in fact, you know, obviously Cleveland beat Golden State two years ago, so we know it's possible. Well, the um, injury luck in the NBA is is the most dramatic of any sport. Right, yeah, it's like it's, overnight you can lose a guy and you're it's, done. I would say yeah. almost, I don't know what the exact rate is, but I would say at least every other year an injury has swung the title in some way. Yeah, I mean, if, you if couldn't you look say at that the, about any other sport. The Warriors were the best team. If you look at the the first title they won, like they they didn't face the starting point guard of I think any team the entire playoffs. If right. my memory's right, yeah, because Pat Beverly was out, Kyrie was out, right, uh, Conley was out. Um, yeah, so I, you know. And again, like, and then to last year, you know, they the Warriors they were the weren't. They weren't 100. No. I mean, they had all their guys on the floor, but I don't think the whole team. No, was 100%. Bogut was gone. Curry was on. You know, when you watch him a year later, you realize how hurt he was in 16. Yeah, but yeah, it's tough. Injuries, you never know. Yeah, the yeah. nobody believes in us factor is always strong. Yeah, hey, we. I learned that one from you. We're just got that going. We did. No one believes in us, Bill. No, you got to get that going. Yeah. Um, there was one more thing I wanted to cover. Oh, this is the last part about just doing your job and things you've learned. Dealing with the media, Twitter, leaks, just this whole culture now of people are just so desperate for information all the time, 24-7, which is not what it was like 10 years mm -hmm. ago. Mm -hmm. um, and stuff getting out that might not be true or interest or interest that maybe you had that you're hoping wasn't get out. And now that gets out. How does that change your job? Uh, it's, it's been like a boiling of the frog. Like, like you don't really notice any key shift or whatever. So, uh, it's always been something, yeah, I don't have a key moment where I'm like, this is where things, this is where things changed. Um, I would say a lot of that stuff really helps us. If you're a destination city like Houston, one of the reasons I'm out front with the media, uh, I, and, and, um, you know, we, you know, we, you know, there's a lot of stuff written about the Rockets. That helps us recruit free agents. It really does. And, like, even meeting with the guys we met with, we met with one prominent guy in the last couple of days, went back to his team. Like, even a lot of his comments were around, you know, how forward-thinking the owner is, how forward-thinking the organization has been for years, how, how forward-thinking Mike D'Antoni's been. And, you know... I love Daryl on the BS podcast. That was important. Yeah. Oh they, yeah, they yeah, don't mention yeah, yeah. That? He, oh, they, he did, okay. he did okay. mention that. I oh, good. Yeah, sorry, sorry. Yeah. So, yeah. Um, <laughs> no, but I, you know, the fact that we have a stable or in our and our owner just you know re-upped all the key people at our team, I think, really does help us in free agency. And so, that's where the media, I think, can really help your team recruit free agents. So, so for the players, you would rank it. They they're looking at city. Just where the city is. I would say, is. no, number one is what star are they pairing with? Among the prominent Oh, interesting. Yeah. Star first. Star first. Star one, two, three. Okay. Then Owner slash culture? Four is city slash organization. Okay. So it's like, you know, just they're, they're, the players are getting smarter. They're looking less at the coach and more at, like, the owner. Because you look at like everyone's like, why is the West on top all these years? You yeah, know, the owners are better. I mean, like there's exceptions. Obviously, Celtics have amazing owner, and I'll forget some others in the East that have great owners. I don't know but if you, you did, but you look, you look one through at least eleven yeah. in the West, and these are like owners that have been really good, and yeah. that that's the difference. So the, I think so. Four is like owner and organization, and then five is probably and city, sort of like all. I'd say tied owner, organization, and city. And then and then and then coach is I'd say coach, own organization, city are like tied and superstars like one two. Three. What about uh, income tax? Ha, huh. that's a good one for you. Texas <laughs> that, that and may, Florida. Yeah, that may that's be. That's got a factor. That may a little be discussed bit. a lot. Yeah, we had a prominent free agent, I'd say like two years ago, who like was asleep, 
the whole meeting and then woke up when we showed him the tax savings. So, oh, really? Like, yeah. Yeah. That one didn't work out. So, I that's hilarious. Those, yeah. Barbecue so. is up there. Uh, we have great barbecue. Yeah. Is that like number eight? Uh, I think it's pretty far down the list. Uh, is it ahead of Gentleman Club? Stuff, uh, Gentleman Jaylen Club's ahead or I would say all the stuff Jalen talks about. <laughs> Champagne and Camp It's a little bit higher up than the barbecue, yeah. So I mean, you could get in Houston, you could live right outside the city and have a house that's like, what, 50,000 square feet? Yeah. I mean, you could have a giant ranch. No, we we show the players. like So if you want, like, so I, um, a... F- let's say a five to $10 million house in like say the Bay area or something is, yeah. is like 800 grand in Houston or right. something like in a, in a nice area. So Jesus. you can get like 20,000 square feet houses. Like Tracy McGrady still has in Sugarland for, you know, like a million and a half or something like that. So wait, I had one last, last question. Um, I feel like the NBA owners are smarter than the NFL owners. I don't know the NFL owners. So, so and, here, to comment. and here's why. I think the NFL owners, a lot of old school money, older guys build it the old way. And it feels like these NBA owners that are coming in now, and now you have almost half the league full of them, these guys that made money like through tech or some sort of new wave industry, they're younger, they think differently, they take chances. Do you feel that in the league? Like since you've Yeah, I think the owners are smarter years? and they're hiring better people. And uh, I do think... I do think that change is is really happening. Yeah, absolutely. And like Adam wants great owners. I want terrible owners. So yeah, I want more bad owners. What you really you need at least you need at least six teams that don't know what they're doing. Is your dream if not more? Like as your you know, dream would be twenty teams that don't know what they're doing. <laughs> at least. Well, I think you've seen the poker analogy. Yeah. It's like. Like if you're the one shark and it's all minnows at the table, you clean up. But if you just had one more shark, like all the profits is divided by two, basically. So even adding one marginal good owner like hurts like our ability to compete like in a big way. So, yeah, well, it doesn't seem like it just seems like the rule of the NBA is there's always going to be a couple. You haven't had your you, when's your bad owner summit coming? You always have oh your bad God. GM summit, but you could. The that bad, could be like a four hour. Podcast. The bad owner summit would be a long you get article. Hired by him, so you're not going to do a bad owner get summit. Out of here. Come on. <laughs> <laughs> that would be a long ass owner summit thing. I do know that they don't like when I make fun of the owners. They they don't. The I've, league the league doesn't like that. Yeah. I yeah. don't blame them because you know who owns the you league. Were hard the owners. On, you were hard on the Clippers in that article a little bit you know, to me. Yeah, I think so. <laughs> Did I, they I cancel your season tickets yet? No, or, I, no, I really like Bomber. He came in, mm. and I, I think he's a smart guy. I think I think he's starting to realize that he he's hit a point that I think a lot of NBA owners hit at some point where they're like, I own the team. I should be making all these decisions and then delegating to somebody. You know, I think the ones that turn things over to other people tend to regret it for the most part. One like thing your I, owner is involved in everything, always right? Always involved. The one thing I talk about, people don't realize it's really important to have an active, involved owner. Yeah. The, the the whole thing where you don't want owner involved, I think, was created by coaches like 30 years ago. Like, Well, because the owners were dumber back then. They were guys that just were waltzing in and be like, hey, let's trade for Bob McAdoo. I can't comment on that, but this is a couple things I say on that. Look, one, the owners are the only people who have the – the fans' interest perfectly aligned. <laughs> They're going to own the team a long time. The fans are going to be a fan a long time. GMs come in and you've seen it. Like they're like they have like two more years on their deal, and they're like yeah. trading like seven draft picks for like that kills the team. Yeah. And that's where you want your owner to step in, and and um, you also want the owners even to hire smart guys, but then ask a lot of questions because. Hopefully I'm decent at my job. There's a bunch of other, like, but he is always asking me questions like, what about this? What about that? What about this? And it's, and it's, he is the reason the Rockets have been like the second best team in the league for the last 20 years. Like we've had a good run while I've been there, but really look at. It's gone back to like 92. Yeah. He's back to, yeah, I think he owned it in 93, two titles and yeah, if you go back to then, I think we're the fourth best record and two titles. And re- and some really bad luck with Yeah. Well, yeah, actually. I mean, that I, Yao is somebody that could have been one of the best 40 players of all time and I think got run into the ground by his country. 
Well, it's actually one of my things I remember with our owner. When Yao got hurt in the second round of the playoffs against the Lakers the year, I thought we could beat him, took him to seven games, even without Yao. Uh, Yao went down, and we were worried this might be it. Right? He he came back and played five more games, but that was, yeah, he was that was pretty much it. And uh, you know, I was talking to Mr. Alexander. I said, "Hey, you know, poor Yao, or whatever." He's like, "Yeah, I really feel bad for Yao, but what about the fans? Like, what about like it's not just." Yeah, obviously that's who we were thinking about at the time, but it's it's all the fans who have put so much into it and everything like that. So it was, uh, you know, I hadn't I hadn't thought about that. I was just worried about Yao and his foot and everything. And yeah, and and he he again, owners are the only ones who only you know coaches you know if they make it four years they're lucky should get longer ten years probably, but uh, and GMs make it like six to ten years usually. It's only the owners who care that you're giving away all your, you know, draft yeah. picks and everything like active, smart owners beats, beats uninvolved owner any day of the week. Daryl Morey. Thanks this was good. Yeah. 12 years of the Rockets now. So coming up on 12. Yeah. Amazing. Nine, uh, uh, oh, six to now. So. And you never really had a dalliance with another team, right? No, I would never. I You're would a never loyal leave. dude. I would never leave. It, you know, Leslie gave me my shot. And, you married uh, the first girl ever kissed you. You stayed with the same actually, NBA sadly, team. Sadly, not the first kiss, but <laughs> <It's> damn, damn <laughs> close. My the first one I went out with at Northwestern, though. Yeah, Ellen. So yeah. You're a loyal guy. I'm. I'm. I'm very. You loyal. saved your best podcast performances for my podcast, which I appreciate. <laughs> I yeah, I. I, I you like, have to admit, I'm a better podcast it, host than Woj. That's not close, actually. Yeah, I love Woj. He's great at what he does. But yeah, like... suck it, Woj. You might have broken every story. <laughs> yeah, he's like literally the king of basketball. But yeah, no, I yeah. mean, you're great at podcasts and writing. He's great at breaking stories, you know? So Woj, yeah, now Woj is going to get his revenge at me. He's going to destroy me. <laughs> I like Woj. I get along with Woj. Uh, ESPN's Adrian Woj are asking now. I know. Uh, the, I would never all, predicted that. Uh, uh, unbelievable. Came to the mothership, man. He's so. they, they sometimes they just target people and they go grab them. Yeah. Um, Daryl Morey, thanks. This was fun. It. Thank you. Good luck. Uh, I don't know when we're running this, but good luck with the rest. Good luck finding your minimum guys. <laughs> Appreciate <laughs> it. Right. Thanks. Thanks. Bye. Thanks, to cousin Sal. Thanks to Tate. Thanks to Daryl Morey. Thanks to the other Ben Simmons. Thanks to ZipRecruiter, the smartest way to hire. My listeners can try it for free at ZipRecruiter.com/slash/bs. Thanks to TheRinger.com. Check us this week as we dive headfirst into uh, Black Panther, Oscars, NBA second half of the season, NFL free agency is coming, spring training, all that stuff. And thanks to Gillette. Get Gillette Performance delivered to your door. No more getting mad at yourself because you just got back from the grocery store and you realized you forgot to buy blades. God, I hate that. Subscribe today. Pick your favorite razor. Get every fourth order free. Visit Gillette online at GilletteOnDemand.com Wednesday. We'll put it up late night Tuesday. Parent Corner, part two. The sequel. Until then. <laughs>